Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Persons and I'm just uh, have the privilege of kicking off today's uh, centennial uh, celebration with GAO. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whichever time zone we're in. Uh, we are thrilled that you're able to join us for this discussion, uh, which is the capstone of GAO centennial celebration, uh, focusing on the next century of accountability. Uh, before we get started, there are just a few housekeeping notes I wanted to say. Uh, the first is that this event is being recorded and will be made available online for future viewing. We encourage you to submit any questions or comments you have for our panelists throughout the event uh, using the chat function in Zoom. Uh, and we will have Q&A at the end of each panel discussion. Our goal is to be as interactive as possible. We have a fantastic a group of experts with us today on two panels, and uh, we want to uh, engage the audience as much as we can. Finally, for those who are uh, planning to submit for a CPE, uh, there will be a link to the certification uh, that's placed in the chat box toward the end of the program. So please stay around uh, to get the certification link and to claim your CPE for this event. And so now it's my pleasure to kick off GAO Centennial Celebration event. And as you know, 2021 marks the 100th anniversary of GAO. And over the past year, we have been examining the trends that have shaped our agency and our country over the last century. But today's discussion looks forward to the key trends of tomorrow that will shape our future and how we might best position ourselves to uh, navigate tomorrow's opportunities and challenges. As you know, we are living in a time of uh, incredible trends. We're in, in, in a, uh, a transformative moment even now and have to deal with many, many things. Uh, and so uh, it's a privilege to be able to introduce both my friend and colleague uh, and practitioner in foresight, uh, Steve Sanford for a few opening and welcome remarks. Thank you very much, Tim. It is an honor to be here today uh, to help uh, celebrate uh, GAO's first 100 years uh, with this final event of the uh, centennial celebrations this year for the agency. My name is Stephen Sanford. I am GAO's Managing Director for Strategic Planning and External Liaison. I am also the Director of GAO's Center for Strategic Foresight. And our office at GAO uh, helps connect the agency to the rest of the world both with uh, partners across the US uh, in the domestic accountability community, uh, international partners. And we also help the agency think about and plan for the future through strategic planning and through strategic foresight. So it's very fitting that we're gathered today, uh, as Tim mentioned, to look ahead at what is coming for the next 100 years uh, for our agency. And uh, as you'll hear today, uh, we have uh, had an amazing transformation as an agency over the last 100 years, and we look forward to continuing that uh, journey uh, to serve the Congress and the American people. It is my pleasure at this point to now introduce the Comptroller General of the United States, Jean Dodaro, who will provide welcoming remarks for today's event. Sir. Thank you very much, Steve and Tim, for your introductory remarks. Uh, good day, everyone. I'm very pleased that you're able to join us to talk about GAO's uh, work as we move forward into our second 100 years. As both Tim and Steve have mentioned, uh, we've been celebrating our 100-year anniversary this year by looking back at how GAO has evolved over the past century. And uh, today we're going to focus more on how we've been preparing to, to do our work in the future. And I'll talk a little bit about those preparations in, in a second. But I wanted to mention to you that this month marks my 49th and a half uh, year in GAO. So I've been very fortunate and privileged to be a key participant in GAO's evolution from largely a financial management organization to a multidisciplinary uh, organization that can take on and review virtually any federal program, policy, regulation, or federal government activity, both underway or contemplated. Each year we produce hundreds of reports 
and testimonies before the Congress by assembling multidisciplinary teams of subject area experts, including those across the full breadth and scope of the federal government's activities and a wide range of technical disciplines so that we produce high quality interdisciplinary institutional products for the Congress. These efforts result in significant legislation, hundreds of billions of dollars every year in financial benefits to the government, and the American people, and important improvements in government operations, including public safety and health. Now, during the time that I've been Controller General over the past decade, I've worked hard with our team at GAO to strengthen our capabilities to do uh, not only contemporary audits, real-time auditing, but also looking to the future to identify emerging issues and to try to focus on issues before they get to be a crisis proportion uh, and uh, difficult, more difficult than to deal with. On the real-time auditing front, during the global financial crisis, the Great Recession, and now during the pandemic, we've actually been doing real-time auditing, helping the Congress and the country deal with these national emergencies. For example, during the pandemic now, we've been providing monthly briefings uh, to the Congress on how the $4.8 trillion that the federal government has put forth to improve our public health and deal with the economic repercussions of the pandemic have been achieving their objectives. We've issued over uh, 200 recommendations with dozens of reports, eight government-wide reports every two or three months in order to provide uh, public uh, transparency to what's happening with this huge amount of money and during this national emergency. Now, in terms of strengthening our ability going forward, it really uh, several different dimensions of what we've been trying to do. One, as Steve mentioned, strategic planning. We've strengthened our strategic planning efforts to produce five-year strategic plans. We're on the threshold of a new one for the next five years that we'll publish early next year. And in these plans, we do environmental scanning to identify uh, trends that will shape the environment in which the federal government will operate and Congress will be making decisions. And these are very important. And we use not only our own institutional knowledge, but the knowledge in the Congress, because we do work uh, for over 90% of the standing committees of the Congress. So we have a wide footprint there and we have a wide range of external advisors and experts, some of which you'll hear from uh, today during this discussion. We've been broadening that group all the time uh, to give us additional perspectives. So that's a really robust strategic planning process. And what we like to produce is what I call a shared agenda between things that we think are important, uh, Congress thinks it's important, and all the experts that we consult with uh, think are essential that we take a look at uh, with, with our work. And the goal is to work on the most important national issues always. Uh, secondly, we established the Center for Strategic Foresight, which includes some futurists and others uh, both from our private sector, academia, and others, uh, uh, some of which you'll hear from today as well, to further strengthen our ability to look ahead on emerging issues and build that into our work. The third, and one of the main focuses of today's discussion, is to build our capacity in science and technology issues. Uh, I've been working on this uh, with Dr. Persons now, uh, for well over a decade. We've great, made great achievements in this area. Uh, I'm gonna ask, continue to ask for additional resources to expand our work going forward. Uh, but this is essential for two very important reasons. One, science and technology issues are so ubiquitous to federal government programs and activities that we normally review. They're essential that we have the uh, requisite capabilities to deal with national defense issues, homeland security, energy, environment, transportation, healthcare, and many more issues. Secondly, the science and technology is evolving faster than any time in human history. And it, Congress needs to have more and uh, more frequent information concerning science and technology issues to be able to respond quickly. It's always difficult for government to react uh, and in this area, the pace is uh, as never before. 
uh, in our government's history. So we need to be prepared to help the Congress meet this growing and increasingly rapid need. And we've been able to do that. We've increased over the past few years with support from the Congress, uh, the number of technology assessments that we're doing, uh, where we bring together both our technical experts in the science, technology, analytics uh, team, along with subject area experts, so we can understand the policy implications of the technology developments. In uh, 5G, artificial intelligence for healthcare, both in more rapid development of drugs, diagnostic capabilities, as well as treatment capabilities. And we've been doing that work in partnership with the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, quantum computing, forensic algorithms. Uh, we've also created an, uh, efforts to provide more short-term technical assistance to the Congress and medium-term projects, developing science and technology spotlights that are two-page explainers of different technologies, the benefits, the implications, some of the policy considerations as well. We've greatly expanded our technical assistance capability to provide more direct assistance to individual members of Congress, as well as uh, the committees of the Congress as they carry out their activities. Uh, we've developed and uh, a uh, foundational document for evaluating uh, algorithms using an artificial intelligence uh, so that we can hold that accountable to a certain set of standards, both from an ethical standpoint or performance standpoint. Uh, as well, we've created an innovation lab where we're testing new technologies and techniques, not only in artificial intelligence, but uh, blockchain uh, technologies uh, and how to audit those areas and many, many uh, other initiatives in this area. So this is a very important component of GAO's most recent evolution. Uh, an ongoing evolution that we've had underway for now. It's been accelerated with congressional help the last couple of years under uh, Tim's leadership. Uh, and I think we're doing uh, very well, but we need to continue to build that capability going, going further in the future. Lastly, I would just say that GAO is very well postured to continue to evolve uh, in the future uh, and to continue to change and meet its needs, which has been a characteristic of our history over the past century. But going forward, not only do we have good strategic planning process, uh, we have a good, uh, not only diverse workforce from a subject area and technical standpoint, uh, but from a demographic standpoint, 58% of our people are women, 35% are minorities. So that enriches our ability to have a diverse set of perspectives as well as all the subject and technical experience that we need. 40% of our people are 40 years or younger. We've been working on succession planning challenges. And I want to have a, a good workforce of the future that can continue and build these capabilities. We've been rated as a best place to work in the federal government by the Partnership for Public Service uh, for the last uh, 15 years straight. This year, we achieved the number one ranking in the best places to work for the federal government, uh, which I'm very proud of. So we have a very, very good, vibrant uh, organization that's highly efficient and effective, but we need and are committed to continuous improvement going forward. So I'm anxious to hear uh, the suggestions today from the panelists. Uh, we're always open to suggestions in GAO. And uh, with that, I would again like to welcome you to this session and turn it over to uh, Dr. Timothy Persons, who's uh, just one, uh, one of our outstanding senior executives in GAO, uh, leading our science and technology work. Tim, over to you. Thanks, Gene. And I think it's in order for me just to thank you for your leadership to have uh, the science tech assessment analytics team uh, that you testified on during your conference and then building the team of our not be without you, as well as uh, the leadership and support of the uh, legislative branch of probes committees that have been supportive of this. So uh, as I wanted to, uh, again, reintroduce myself. I'm, I am the Tim Persons, the chief scientist of the GAO. Uh, I'm also the co-managing director of our science technology assessment and analytics team. 
Uh, as Jean mentioned, uh, this is this was a key thing that that we've been growing. Uh, we're not quite done yet, and we're still still working on it. Uh, but to, to understand a little bit more about the team is that uh, we help GAO and the Congress understand the science and tech uh, innovations and their effect, uh, either current or their uh, potential future effect uh, or effects uh, on our nation, on the, uh, the environment, the economy, uh, uh, society, uh, et cetera, in the ethical, legal, social issues. We also uh, do oversight of uh, federal s and programs and research and development, and we have uh, thinkers on that today to, 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 to talk about that, especially as it pertains to the new fourth industrial revolution that we're in, this digital economy, and how we maintain or encourage uh, competitiveness and innovation for the benefit of the American people. But I really just wanted to amplify, as, as I pivot, I'm going to introduce our, our experts in a moment, but three things that the Comptroller General said. Uh, one was the number of challenges that we are facing today, right? Think climate change, cybersecurity, uh, global pandemics, et cetera. So we have uh, a, a large number of things and, and that's a key factor of why uh, we are uh, needing to even more so today, look into the, net, to the future uh, century of GAO to, to deal with these issues in a agile uh, and in, in, in a digital content centric manner. The second is uh, the uh, breadth of the issues. Uh, as, as Gene had mentioned, there's AI, there's 5G. He mentioned national insecurity and homeland issues, uh, uh, homeland security issues. Those are, are uh, we just cover a very broad area. s and isn't strictly just for the NCAA. We have all of our sister teams working in various things and the science and tech is, is popping up there. Uh, but the third area is the rate of, of, of those things. And so, uh, it feels like when it rains, it pours with these shocks of these trends all coming and, and converging at one time. And so now more than ever, we are uh, thinking with uh, foresight for sure as we look forward to our, our forthcoming uh, century. So very excited today with the distinguished panel of experts that we have. Uh, and I'd like to just uh, pause and introduce them uh, one at a time. So the first I'll introduce is Bill Bonvillian, who's a lecturer and who's the senior director, or director of special projects with uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT's Office of Digital Learning. Uh, and he is also, importantly, a Polaris Council member. And uh, Gene mentioned our expertise that we've been building and the advisory bodies that we have. And we, we are honored to have Bill uh, on Polaris and we're, we're, uh, we're thankful for his uh, insight for that. Uh, he's been a lecturer at MIT um, since uh, many, 17 years. He's been a, a senior policy advisor in the U.S. Senate. Uh, he's been uh, in directing MIT's Washington office from 2006 to 2017. And he teaches uh, on science and tech policy at MIT and again, leads this office of digital uh, learning. So uh, welcome, Bill. Uh, if you turn your uh, camera on and just wave, that will be helpful. Thank you. Um, next is Suzette Kent. I'm delighted to introduce Suzette. She's our former federal chief information officer, uh, and she had uh, served in this role from January 29 in, in uh, 2018 uh, through July of 2020. And uh, as CIO, Suzette was responsible for setting federal IT policy and leading the federal CIO council, which is composed of CIOs from various federal government departments and agencies. So prior to this, she came uh, and she was a principal of the Banking and Capital Markets Advisory Team at the Ernst & Young Financial Services Office in Dallas. Uh, importantly, in her post-government life, Suzette's uh, I'm proud to call her a friend, and she's uh, a, a great th uh, thinker and leader about data and analytics and what that, that means. And so you'll, uh, I have no doubt we'll be hearing about that uh, kind of a discussion today with Suzette and others as we think about AI. Uh, then next we have uh, Yuri Beckelman, who's the staff director for the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Uh, Yuri was appointed on January 26 of 2021 as the staff director for the Select Committee, but he is a veteran uh, congressional staffer with more than 15 years of policy and management experience. Uh, most recently, he was serving as the deputy chief of staff to Representative Mark Takano. Mr. Takano uh, is a, 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 a big proponent of the growth of s and capabilities within the Congress. And so Yuri has a lot of depth and experience through Mr. Takano's office and now with the Select Committee on Modernization of Congress. 
Uh, he also has experience as a senior advisor to the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. And then last but certainly not least, I'm proud to introduce a member of STAA's staff, particularly uh, the Innovation Lab, our, our newest entity uh, within SDAA and GAO that uh, the Comptroller General mentioned. Uh, this is Jessica uh, Guillory. She is a senior data scientist and she spent her career in analytics and statistician or as a statistician, as a survey methodologist, a research administrator, uh, working in the uh, academic environment. And as a data, one of GAO's data scientists in the innovation lab, she focuses on data-driven designs that include data literacy, data governance, automation, visualization, uh, and really the, the whole purpose of the innovation lab is to try and drive uh, evolutions or maybe even uh, transformative capabilities uh, to support evidence-based policymaking for both GAO and the Congress moving forward. So those are our distinguished panelists. Uh, thanks and, uh, and uh, it's glad, it's, it's a delight to, to have you all here. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, we're going to ask, uh, we're, we ask you to ask your questions in the chat throughout the hour. Uh, we're going to uh, try and address them as they come up, uh, and then especially if they're relevant to the real-time discussion. We will have an open uh, Q&A session beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, and at that time, uh, again, we'll encourage the use of the chat teachers to raise any questions to the panel. So, with that, let me uh, kick off the panel discussion with the question. Bill, I'll just start this one with you. Uh, and this is a multi-part, you know, this is consistent with the way oversight uh, operates, as you know, having been a staffer yourself. There's a layered question, so I'll, we'll get through this, but really wanted to have you kick us off and tell us what you see as some of the key trends in the S&T policy community that we need to be getting smart on right now. Right. The other thing related to that then, Bill, is what are the fundamental changes that you see and how the federal government approves and manages major R&D spending now and into the future? And you might want to talk about the Endless Frontier Act. Uh, I know you've had, you have a lot of thinking on that, writing on that, as well as the infrastructure bills uh, as examples of how you see uh, oversight of R&D needing to change moving into the future. So Bill, if you kick us off, uh, then we'll uh, allow comments for the other panelists uh, once you uh, make, your, make your remarks. Thank you. Sure, Tim. Let me try and give you kind of an integrated answer to that and reflect on some of the things that I'm seeing starting to emerge. Look, there, there really is an emerging US industrial strategy uh, that's starting to happen. I'm really kind of seeing something of a sea change and US R&D policy. It's going to require new science and te technology capabilities and new oversight. Uh, you know, what are, the, what are the drivers here? You know, we've got a very significant competition over technology leadership with China that's involving a lot of, a lot of impetus for new energy technology development. And then we're in a pandemic. The pandemic in turn has driven a significant science response as well. Uh, over $100 billion is either in place or is now pending for these kind of what I will call industrial strategy programs that, that move from our historic kind of let's do research, leave the rest to something else, industry primarily, but moving from that research only kind of focus to including the later stages, the later stage development, the prototyping, the demonstration and testing, pilot production, and market creation and implementation. In other words, these policies start to move us down the innovation pipeline to include not just research, but the later stages as well. So you know, this is not the first time we've done this, right? So there've been at least five periods when science and technology policy was driven to include this industrial strategy element, i.e. to become more connected. Uh, during World War II, we really created a very connected system between industry, government, and universities in the course of that conflict. Then in the post-war period, there was a real disconnect. Fenever Push, the architect of, uh, of US science organization in many ways, pushed for a basic research model. Um, that got applied to the civilian R&D agencies. Then Sputnik uh, was the next stage, a third stage where the Defense Department really had to fully reconnect its system, re really reintegrate with industry and with, with university research. And DARPA and NASA came out of this period. Fourth period was, was around 
competitiveness, the kind of 1980s competition over uh, manufacturing and quality production with Japan, the Bayh-Dole Act, SPIR, Semitech, the Manufacturing Extension Program, the R&D tax credit, a suite of programs that move further down that pipeline began evolving. In more recent years, then kind of two major efforts starting in the 2000s, a real focus on reorganizing for energy technology development. Um, and then lately, for the last five or so years, a focus on advanced manufacturing. Each one of these was driven by its own kind of crisis need, uh, which are historically the big drivers for science and tech change. Um, the driving factors during the Cold War were it was strategic competition. In this new era, strategic competition for sure, but a whole new dimension of economic com competition has been added to that, plus energy, plus the pandemic. Uh, so we've got five major industrial strategy efforts reflecting one or more of these sets of issues that are on the way. And let's quickly look at what some of those are, Tim. You know, Operation Warp Speed, kind of a model industrial strategy. Um, the coronavirus exposed incredible supply chain vulnerabilities. Operation Warp Speed um, really played a significant role in moving the vaccine development and production period from like four to 10 years to eight months. Very dramatic shift uh, with a lot of lessons learned there for the future. It used a portfolio approach, it picked winners by selecting the companies that were furthest ahead and in kind of four areas of vaccine technologies. It relied deeply on, on fi a financing mechanism, guaranteed federal contracts, the pre-ordering of vaccines. Uh, there was a deep integration of agency personnel from the health agencies with the companies to help them through the approval processes. Uh, no compromise on standards, but a lot of communication. Uh, the federal government funded and organized the clinical trials in a very systematic kind of way with industry. And there was a major role in a certification and validation step, this emergency use approval. Uh, and then vaccine delivery with military and FEMA systems. So that was a kind of a standout project with very dramatic and quite successful results. Uh, the CHIPS Act, which you know confronts growing um, international competition in a critical underlying technology, semiconductors. Um, the CHIPS Act is, uh, is, uh, has been passed by Congress. There's a $53 billion appropriation that's pending, inserted into the Endless Frontier Act that I'll get to in a minute. It finances new fabrication plants and foundries for U.S. chip manufacturing, has a big research technology development, scale up set of programs and advanced chip technologies new research consortia. It strengthens manufacturing and supply chains. Uh, funding here is for both commerce and defense as well as industry. The Endless Frontier Act passed the Senate 64 to 32 in June. Um, it's now renamed Innovation and Competition Act there. And then a narrower house version called NSF for the Future passed by a wide bipartisan margin over there on the House side, has funding for over a five-year period to NSF Commerce Energy. It creates a new $29 billion technology directorate within NSF. Historically, NSF is the basic research agency. This is a new applied technology directorate. It's going to look at 10 advanced technology areas uh, from AI and quantum to high-performance computing and robotics and biotechnology, cybersecurity, and others. It funds the CHIP Act, CHIPS Act, so it's got a major semiconductor element. The new technology directorate will fund a whole new group of university technology centers, sort of a new applied focus at universities. Uh, it has testing and demonstration funding. It's got a financing provision, uh, and it creates regional innovation hubs uh, in a, on a competitive basis around the country to spur innovation regionally. A fourth measure, the infrastructure bill, there's $25 billion in there for energy technology demonstration projects and carbon management, clean hydrogen, renewable energy, nuclear energy, and critical materials and, and minerals. It creates a whole new DOE office of clean energy demonstrations. Fifth element here is supply chain resiliency. There was a major White House report in June 
appropriations are pending in many of these areas to implement new programs in areas like pharmaceuticals and ingredient supply chains, advanced battery supply chains, critical minerals, semiconductors, all looking at the supply chains, not just the research side. But there are blind spots. You know, we need a new framework to cope with these industrial strategy kind of requirements. We need kind of a new infrastructure here, as well as the talent base to staff it. Uh, there, there are a series of foundational elements that we're gonna to have to think hard about that are not necessarily in place now that we're gonna to have to have to manage these kinds of massive programs. We're gonna need better connections to research programs. We're gonna need a whole new cadre of trained and experienced managers. This is not like managing an R&D project. It is very different. We're gonna to have to have teams that are experienced in development, project management, finance, implementation. We're gonna to need to understand regional innovation. Um, and then for scaling up a new level of integration with the private sector, because all these sectors are gonna be led on the private sector side, new kinds of public private partnerships are gonna be required here. Testing and demonstration so that we get to working prototypes. Uh, technology certification uh, that, that by creating standards attempts to move technologies and accelerate their introduction. Integration on the manufacturing side, we learned lessons about the problems with trying to innovate here and produce there, which in turn has been leading to a tendency to produce there and therefore we have to innovate there as well. Those are very problematic future developments in the US that we're gonna to need to watch if we wanna preserve manufacturing capability here and the innovation capacity that goes with it. And then, on the support side of an industrial strategy, and there are elements that call for this, there are financing pieces, there are federal procurement pieces outside of defense, and there are flexible contracting mechanisms. The Defense Procurement Act has been widely used in the Operation Warp Speed, and it's, going to, it's called for in the supply chain initiatives, and then other transactions authorities as well, other kinds of, of contracting mechanisms too. So to wrap up, there's elements of US industrial strategy that are starting to merge outside of the defense sector. It's gonna be development, not just research. It's gonna be supply chain support. It's gonna be critical technology implementation. It's gonna be manufacturing programs. It's gonna be financing elements. You know, there've been failures in industrial policy kind of areas in the past, particularly for energy demonstrations. So we're gonna to have to organize if we're gonna get these right. And the stakes are very high in getting these right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. And just it seems like uh, I've noticed a similar thing in terms of a summary comment is uh, just using the Apple iPhone, right? The idea of design to Cupertino and manufactured in Foxconn is, is uh, that's being rethought. And this, this whole reshaping of supply chains really accelerated by the pandemic, I think is a, is a, is a big trend. So uh, thanks for that. Let me just see if there are any comments from the fellow panelists here very briefly. Any questions from the audience, please put them in the chat. Tim, this is Suzette. And I, I, I wanna just add, Bill laid out such a great framework. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just tuck in a couple of interesting points. You know, he's industry, government, universities, and public-private partnerships. Um, I feel like that's, that's one of the areas we still get to work together in public-private partnerships. And um, I, I should have also said congratulations to uh, Comptroller Dadera on the whole GAO team on hitting 100 years. But as, as, as you look at that framework that's laid out, we're trying to advance all the pieces at the same time, right? So the funding goes to American citizens and universities and our federal agencies that are leading the charge. And, and that piece of the revolution does force us to look at, um, and, and Bill pointed it out, cross-discipline capabilities. And you asked a, a, a kind of a, in your layered question, you, you, you kind of ended that with, with some of the things that were going on in oversight. Um, and Jessica may have additional comments there, but all those pieces, we see them manifest themselves in both the data um, acquisition and use space across all of those, what we do with citizens, how um, public and private come together, what we're doing in research, um, the capabilities that we're trying to launch. And, and the oversight in R&D has such an important role 
and helping ensure those connections are staying in place. And as Gene said in his opening, asking the technical questions as well as sometimes the um, ethical and service level, you know, questions about, you know, how do we treat privacy and individual rights, you know, in the right way and consider those as we're moving at an incredible pace because of the technology, the high performance compute um, in a very challenging cyber world. So that, that oversight role becomes a, a key part of advancing the whole at the same time across all those different components uh, that Bill talked about, especially because the agencies don't own them singularly. They are also working, you know, in hopefully cooperation um, in their ability to deliver that. So th those are some of the things that when I think about the role for the next hundred years are gonna be critically important to our success as the world leader. Thanks, Suzette, very well said. Um... I think, again, just uh, I'm hearing the summary because the, like you said, the Comptroller General talks about interdisciplinarity, like that's what we're doing as a team here, reflecting what we're trying to do to support oversight, insight, and foresight for Congress moving forward. But the general ecosystem, as Bill was outlining uh, things, we really do have to have what I call a large aperture look at things to have this interdisciplinary, cross-sectoral uh, and I would I would add that the other the way of business has to be agile. We we can no longer take as long as you know we 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 used to take uh, to try and drive things. I think the time dimension is just is the rap rapidity of the change and the sh the shocks that come upon us and that's causing things. So okay, so um, uh, if there are no other comments from any of the panelists, Suzette, since you have the floor, let me just pick on you too. Go to a question because <laughs> you did mention data. Data are the new oil, right? And we talk about trends and oversight, and you certainly know what that's about. Having a key role as our federal CIO, uh, think about implementing FATARA and having that again broad look. All of the various things that uh, you had to do. And by the way, thank you for your uh, tremendous leadership and and what you did uh, in your service, and then certainly as you've continued to move forward. But really, I think the, the, the key thing is what are the, in the new digital innovation world, these sort of trends, including technologies using data and analytics and AI, how's that going to affect operations in federal agencies? Uh, what can we learn uh, from each other in the federal agencies uh, when they're using things like AI? And, and have we seen any agencies make transitions? Because as you know, change is easy to say harder to do uh, and what were some of the use cases or success stories in that regard. So Suzette, over to you. Yeah, sorry, my, my video kicked off there. There we go. Um, well, the, the exciting thing, Tim, is, is this is not a conceptual discussion. It is here and now, and there are use cases. You know, we, we have made progress both on the first year and now they just put out the second year of federal data strategy across agencies. And that's about not just using data um, with a disciplined approach inside federal agencies, but many agencies who have a mandate to share that for reasons to support you know, our economy, homeland security, um, and very specifically research. Um, and, and how we make that available to research communities um, and, and support that in different ways. But you know, we saw situations where now in various agencies, they've been able to use AI, machine learning, um, other types of automation and high-performance computing to advance you know, important things. HHS shared a business case where they, they took out, you know, um, repetitive regulations. The VA did some really important things in combining different types of data to help intervene in health situations um, with veterans in situations that were very dire. Just uh, early November, the IRS chief procurement officer shared an RPA case that I love. They had to modify almost 1500 contracts, which that process would have taken them a year to do manually. And they did it in 72 hours using automation. They, they shared that success case, but to be able to do that in all those situations, there had to be fidelity of data, an, um, a, you know, a, a rich um, examination and understanding of not just the capabilities and the build of the technology and the key algorithms, 
but the business processes and the data that went along with it. So those success stories demonstrated the evolution of the capabilities. And I think we're gonna you know, continue to see more, but as we look to the next hundred years and that data is coming from many different devices, um, different places and gathered in different ways, we have to also um, be very focused kind of on the, the, the provenance and fidelity of the day that we're getting, where it's coming from, not only just you know how we're using it, but but are we comfortable and confident in the integrity of that towards the purpose that that we're trying to use? And I, on my screen, I keep looking over at Jessica because I know she's done lots of, of work in this space. And I'm going to end it with one last thing, Tim. Um, the you know the public-private partnerships, and I know that you um, ha have joined us in some conversations with the you know Coleridge Initiative, which is a group of universities and in private interest and companies in looking at ways that we can use federal data to solve big problems faster and transparently in the public forum. And that's one of the, it's another kind of key to how we go forward is finding ways to move faster and then embed those, you know, inside how we deliver services and capabilities inside the federal government. Yeah, thanks, Suzette. The um the the case for speed is is definitely that's that's incredible. 72 hours is what's often what we're really trying to look for in the uh, innovation lab is is driving to solutions with exponentially less time and but at the same time, uh, the Comptroller General absolutely correctly has the, the key focus is on quality with respect to our work. So we're never going to sacrifice quality. It's how you get quality in an efficient way. And, and so that's where we're excited to do that. Um, let me see if uh, other candidate, or, or, I'm sorry, other panelists have other um, comments on Suzette, what you were just talking about. So uh, Jessica or uh, yeah, Bill so or Yuri, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Suzette, Suzette uh, brought up some great um, interesting ideas about our federal data strategy, which we plan on implementing and we are implementing quite well within GAO and automation and data governance. Those are two big key items that I plan to go in a little bit more in detail. And I'm glad she brought those up. So those are really good things. And also Bill mentioned, um, when he mentioned Operation Warp Speed, dashboarding, uh, quick data is something that is very important to us to give those, to give people the keys to get quick insights. Um, that's really important in terms of having the data available quickly for them. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here a little bit. We've been spending quite a bit of time on the committee kind of um, trying to assess Congress's ability to make decisions based on high quality data. And I love this conversation about uh, data fidelity, right? Like the idea that there, Congress has a really, has a really difficult time finding, um, you know, pulling, you know, pulling the noise and the static out of really complex data sets and making decisions based on it, right? The signal and the noise is something that is quite discussed. You know, um, as we're building out our capacity, uh, Congress needs its support agencies to, to continue to share what is, uh, what is what they are capable of and what they can achieve and what they can pull in. Congress doesn't have an understanding of that. If you are discussing things like AI, um, there, there are extremes here and there is a belief that either it is magic and it will solve all of our problems or, uh, you know, or that it just, it doesn't work and it, and it is totally fallible and there is no business case scenario for it. And we need to get on, on these complicated technology issues. Congress starts in these two camps of it's either magic or it's, it's broken. And through the great work that you all do of trying to help Congress understand these technologies, we have a better job, we do a better job of turning them into real life applications that benefit um, the work that the, 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 the legislation that we work on and the, the tools we try to provide to the agencies. Um, but at this point, it's still it's it's still pretty difficult, as we especially when it comes to data. So we need to do a better job of trying to kind of get across what data can do in its current form for Congress. Great, thanks, Yuri. Um, Yuri, since you have that, let me just with you because again, 
talk about the business of oversight and the future of it. And by the way, I love the, like I said, I, I love the um, wall hanging behind you because you know Congress gets a lot of ask. Uh, it's it's I've I've heard and I think it's argued it's one of the most solicited bodies in the world, uh, you know, and it yet also probably the most criticized by uh, for good or for ill, which whichever part you you think about that. But oversight is very both. important. It yes. deserves both. It deserves right. love and affection and it deserves some right. criticism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so really, when you think about the first branch and doing oversight on that and where we are, you know, you know, uh, since celebrating our century of, of right. being, uh, a key, uh, by at least by headcount, the largest of the congressional uh, apparatus uh, elements to, to help you do your job. This really, this question is about the future of, of oversight. So what does it really look like uh, when, you know, sometimes getting agencies to transform uh, is already a challenge, but sometimes even when they're doing that, maybe not the clock speed that we want to, it still feels like sometimes uh, oversight committees that have jurisdiction over them are, are yet still behind even that. So the, the thing is trying to keep up, it's almost like a double problem. How do you keep the oversight up with the, mm -hmm. the change that it needs to be doing to, to have its scrutinizing function you know, under Article One of the Constitution? So what are the challenges that you see the oversight community facing and not only coming to speed on cutting edge policies, but the basic tools of daily communication and coordination? Yeah, uh, collecting, uh, understanding, deciphering, and translating data is something that uh, Congress as an institution has a real uh, gap in, in understanding. We, we've I've been working in this space for a while, and we still have a large technology gap that we've had for a while. We do a really bad job of conflating four areas of technology for a staffer. Your technology staffer is the person who does your IT, who does your social media, uh, you know, who builds the, the technology tool for your, for your office and also handles technology policy. It's way too often those four are completed. They are all, um, we are small offices and small operations, so, but we've gotten better in that space, frankly. And, and it's, and, and it's, a, it's a kudos to everyone that's worked on highlighting how big of a problem that is. Um, and, you know, you look at people like Travis Moore over at Tech Congress, um, and, you know, Zach Graves over at Lincoln, who have really highlighted this big problem, uh, and there has been attention paid to it. I will say that even though we've gotten better there, understanding and deciphering data is something that we have almost no capacity, very little capacity on in a meaningful way. Um, our committee has been looking at and offering recommendations on, uh, uh, on, on spending more time trying to train staff so they understand how to get get through this as someone who's tried to dig into this in the past we have a big problem of you know data being really difficult to dig through i've it's i'm sure as you all know every agency that we speak with has a a different protocol for how they provide access to that data what data that comes in you know i've been spent sent you know three hundred thousand cell excel nonsense spreadsheets that like are not useful. Um, similarly, you go to um, uh, you go to the, you go to the census, or you go to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, and you can get one set of data by using their public-facing website, and another set of data by calling the Congressional Relations, and uh, that doesn't serve anyone well. And these are frustrations we are dealing with and trying to understand, and we need to spend some time. Um, in, in digging through this. Um, a recommendation we actually passed today. Um, this is a, we, we passed 25 recommendations today, which are, we're very proud of um, in both the civility and collaboration space, um, but also in the congressional support agencies and evidence-based lawmaking space. And one of them is a recommendation to put it together a task force to look into things such as a chief data officer. And a chief data officer yeah, uh, it, it is not just about um, compiling data uh, that we produce. It's also about um, deciphering and collecting data that is useful to Congress and training staff on how to understand that data. So we are digging into this, but it is a huge staff capacity issue that we have not paid very much attention to that we need to. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you're, I, it really is to, to um, 
to Suzette's point about the complexity of uh, the challenges, sort of the interdisciplinary nature, uh, things e even with committees with large jurisdictions, sometimes things just aren't fitting neatly into that. So the, really the coordination is easy to say, but hard to do. And, uh, you know, I, I think I hear you saying, you know, that we, we can have data driven uh, evidence-based policymaking might help out in that regard, even though that's still hard. Or is, is that correct? Or would you add to any other thing? Like, how do you attack that problem of the people want it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. People, people want it. People are desperate for it. People are hungry for it. I can tell you that, you know, uh, when we are putting together proposals, we are trying to understand the real world, real world impacts out there. Um, and too often um, we assign either uh, a, you know, a binary like look at it that it is either going to, you know, cost too much or cost too little, and that's not the the point of data. The data is, gives you a range to try to understand the real world implications of it and how we can continue to adjust. And that is something that Congress does a really bad job at, uh, at understanding. I'll tell you about a fun project I did though uh, to try to kind of get Congress more in this space. Um, there was Congress, while it's uh, might be averse to. Are, are, are lacking an understanding of data, it, it does love a good chart. And I worked on a project here, it was kind of a fun idea that, called International Chart Day. And we brought in and highlighted um, how, some of, how some of the world's great um, uh, data visualization experts build and populate and, and translate data for the public and had them come in and share that information. And then did an evening kind of reception along with some of the best floor charts we'd seen for the year um, to kind of build a culture around the idea that data can is interesting, informative, can be uh, can be entertaining, grab people's attention, um, and so we need to continue to keep doing some some fun projects like that as well as building capacity amongst our staff. But there is a hunger for it; people want it. Uh, you know, people and frankly, the American people are demanding more of it. It's almost like the the, the CSI effect, right? Like the, that if you hear, um, if you hear law enforcement folks, they hear uh, the, the public, it has a higher expectations of forensic tools being used in, that some are somewhat unrealistic um, for everyone, but are, are expected because that's the perception that, that, that media and, you know, has given that is available. Um, that is carrying over to, to lawmaking. The, the public expects a certain amount of uh, 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 of, of data collection and understanding of real world implications to go into these decisions that we are making that we are not equipped for yet and that we will have to meet if we are going to make the public happy, which is sort of what we are constantly trying to do in Congress, make our constituents feel like they are being represented well. Yeah. We also have, uh, in partnership with our communications team, because Part of this is just the need for digital communications. When SDAA was stood up, there was a, a strong need to, to help Congress not only deliver good quality work, but help Congress absorb that in an efficient and, and a legislative ops tempo for the 21st century. And so we did stand up, our Jean mentioned uh, the digital dashboards and how we're thinking about oversight now. We did that for OWS, Bill mentioned that program, it's in the chat. Uh, but let me go, uh, throw it to Suzette. I think uh, you have an example for this as I recall as well. Is that right? Yeah, that, a, yeah. a specific example. And in, in, what, in what you just said, you, you said a key word, helping Congress absorb before or kind of during as a part of a life cycle versus only when you're talking about an event or a particular issue, because sometimes that is overwhelming. And, you know, one example in, in, or, or, or one, you know, situation, almost every member of Congress wants to talk about outcomes. And whereas not many people wanted to talk about data cleansing or non <laughs> anonymity right. or collection or whatever. And there was a, a you know a particular thing that, that we're, we're doing now about how much does a healthy meal cost Americans around you know, our country? And we're using scanner data, you know, from public private partnerships and USD and, and all these different pieces. It's a very complicated set of, um, you know, data collection and algorithms and oversight. But that's not as interesting as the the outcomes, right? And so, so in in engaging in the com in the conversation with members of Congress, 
to, to Yuri's last point, starting with what's the outcome we're trying to achieve or what's the thing that's being driven and then highlight, you know, the pieces that are needed for policy or funding or resourcing support um, it is a way that, that we can help be translators. And I know that, you know, GAO does that and brings in other people to help do that, to help move faster. So making the, the real something that, that may be, you know, shame complex, much closer, bringing it much closer to the outcome and the results that we want to achieve. Yeah, thanks, Suzette. That's, that's, uh, that's fantastic insight. Um, Bill, let me just, because uh, I know we're going to pivot to Jessica in just a moment, because we're going to hear from a practitioner of this. Like, like you said, Suzette, it's, you know, the, nobody wants to hear about how hard the data engineering is, although it's critically important. That's usually the heavy lift. Uh, behind things, and and it's you know again easy to say, hard to do. So we'll hear from Jessica in a moment about that, and especially governance. But uh, um, before we did, I wanted to see if Bill, in your 17 years on the Senate, you know, you have a lot of experience in oversight. Uh, where do you see it going today to deal with these um, complex adaptive systems challenges that we really are facing today? You know, Tim, I, I concur with uh, with the comments that uh, that Yuri and Suzette have been making. I mean, this is a capability that uh, that we're going to need to have in the oversight process to really be able to do the kind of analysis that uh, that's needed. Uh, you know, but as as you heard from from you know my rap, um, you know, there's a whole series of kind of new roles that the government is going to be playing here as we move towards an industrial strategy kind of approach. Data is one analytical piece, mm -hmm. but there's a whole series of skill sets that the government is going to have to have, and we're going to need to build the oversight capability to be able to understand where those are working and where they aren't working and how to fix them. Uh, because at the moment, we don't really have that capability piece in place to kind of manage these new strategies that are going to be sent our way. All right. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. So. All right, well, um, let me pivot just because the, the phrase data governance has come up a number of times. And uh, I'm actually, uh, after I introduce her, I'm gonna put it in the chat box. We have uh, a GA report that actually just went out on the status of data governance in the federal government. So uh, a, a big topic, a big time, uh, but we're gonna hear from Jessica as a practitioner uh, on this particular uh, topic to, to help us out in this regard. So. Uh, really, Jessica, from the perspective of, of the practitioner, what do you see as the key areas of growth and upskilling uh, that uh, federal knowledge uh, workers like analysts, data scientists, et cetera, are going to need in order to effectively utilize new technologies? And with that, what are the tools in the trade uh, that are going to be for oversight uh, of the oversight community? It could be GAO auditors. It could be congressional staff. What is that going to look like in the next century or after a century? And how are we at GAO planning to upskill in that regard? So, uh, Jessica, uh, over to you. Okay. Well, Tim, in the next hundred years, I'll still be here at GAO to help us navigate through that. <laughs> I'm very pleased to hear that. That's, that's very comforting. <laughs> so, Yuri, Suzette, and Bill brought up some very uh, good points, interesting topics that I just want to go over in general of how us at GAO uh, are modernizing our data strategy. First, we're looking at data literacy, then data governance, and then data science. So within data literacy, we, we focus on being problem centric, no matter what part of the agent, what part or what area of GAO you're in, whether you're in engagements to Congress or you're in uh, HR, building operations or IT. So we wanna encourage and enable everyone to use data to make decisions. So in our data literacy program, we wanna give support and motivation and the tools, abilities, and also give access to the data. Now, in keeping up with that, and I think it was Bill who mentioned something about that, Bill and Suzette, in keeping up with the outside skills to integrate, we want to maintain and improve contractor and private sector relationships, which involve learning and data literacy. So the next focus would be data governance. Now, data governance is, is very, it's a very broad topic, and but it's overall, it's the strategy for handling data to maximize its value. 
One important thing at GAO is also knowing what we have. So that's one part of data governance is knowing what we have, right? So in that, we want to build a robust data governance ecosystem to eliminate these data silos. Because once Bob retires, we need to know what data is out there, what he did, quick access to it. And that's one component of data governance. And the next part is data science. So in terms of data science, uh, we could talk about the data science infrastructure. Uh, Bill, Yuri, and Suzette all mentioned all this data that's hard to get uh, easy access. We want to have scalable storage capabilities of data. So within data science, we have different parts, not only uh, the actual analytics part, but we have the data architecture and data engineering. So we want to increase our computing power, which is going on now, because we're going to have a lot more data in 100 years. We have a lot now. So we need that efficiency and speed to decisions. Uh, Bill mentioned um, Operation Warp Speed is a dashboard. We want to have easy and available access. So we want to have these, I, I would call it self-service analytics, creating automated process, creating dashboards, as Bill mentioned with Operation Warp Speed, and just having data available for people. Now, as we go from the value, we go from hindsight to foresight. So we looked at the value of previous centennial events, and now we're going to foresight. And the same applies to data analytics, right? We, we want to apply this to data. What did we do in the past, the hindsight part, and also what we can do in the future. So we could use the data to decide what should we do next. And we also have a, later, a lot of data out there, right? So we have more data options and we also need more storage. For example, we just don't have tabular data anymore. We have video data, we have image, we have auto text, tweets. We have to have that available to us and we have to have it in, in a storage system that's scalable and that we could easily get to and analyze. That's great. So, uh, I really want to focus on the human capital piece. So the part of this, uh, Jessica, because you're a example of that. So I like talking with you because you are uh, the, the vision of the future. And I, I sincerely hope you stay around as, as much as we can uh, um, uh, with advances in regenerative medicine or things. We'll keep you for another hundred years. So now we'll let you retire when it's time to come. But uh, the, the, the point is, is really human capital. And the Comptroller General has spoken well on this. Uh, we in our STAA have work on uh, the STEM or the science, tech, engineering, math workforce. Uh, and of course, data science is involved in that kind of thing. How can we think about developing and, and getting more Jessicas, right? So we, we need more of that. Uh, um, how should we think about that? And, and what should our strategy be? Yeah, so I would say, you know, we have people not only you know, we can get people with PhDs in statistics, but what, how do we focus on those people who have humanities degrees? I think that's where it comes in important, the data literacy. So data literacy is pretty broad. We could have it from the leadership perspective all the way to the uh, analyst or the, and the PDP, right? So we can give access and we could give tools and the abilities to grow whether they want to just learn how to build dashboards versus where they want to learn deep learning or predictive modeling. So giving people the tools to be able to learn this and upskill themselves for that would be able to would help with uh, increasing our capacity. Yeah. So it seems it's it's almost as if we're going to have just like uh, decades ago with the, the rise of the desktop, you know, personal computer and the PC. Having a PC was necessary but not sufficient. You had to have usage of that and and. There are folks who are going to work on computers all the time and it could be very in-depth technically and then there are folks that are going to use a computer as a tool and they don't really need to know all the the back end type things uh, they need to, know how to use it they need to have a general understanding but there's a, a variance in other words for for things like data science and ai you know does everyone need to have uh, a phd from mit or carnegie mellon in order to do the work and the answer is no but we do have to think about that spectrum of work uh, and, and look across those those various things. So, you know, um, Tim, so, yeah, I, I, I want to have one thing. Can you, you know from our other conversations yes. from the private sector work that I do, this is one of the areas I'm really passionate. I'm going to answer it a little differently and even more blunt. We need to start the conversations younger in school. I mean, yeah. I, we need to be making making the the future 
roles in technology and critical thinking interesting and exciting in elementary school and you know those are some of the things congress has a hand in and making those available along the whole pipeline but for everyone that's currently part of the workforce making continuous skilling and reskilling and access to capability de development part of our working world right we 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 have you know we have things we have to do today but as we look to that next hundred years we have to start the foundation a long time you know before otherwise every single agency is going to be fighting you for jessica to come work at their age oh that, that's already happening <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah, they need right. the skills so that's so right. it's a bigger conversation and that's a conversation about today the future and then like i said investing in our workforce, whether it's the GAO team or, or agency teams. Um, I, I know the thing that often frustrated me when I was inside the government is I would see some of that um, continuous learning in places when we would move to a major new technology, not be part of the plan. Um, and, you know, if we're not investing in, in all of that kind of simultaneously, back to the way Bill started us off, we can't advance that cross-disciplinary um, agenda at the same time. So we, what, what the folks here can do is, is be aggressive in, in all the places where we need to build talent. Thanks, yeah, I knew, I, I knew that was a key thing you jump in on, Suzette, the passion you have, which is great about the, uh, the, the human capital issues. And I, I wanna jump in here real too. It's, yeah, please, it's, I think, yeah. I think it's not just about um, human capital and understanding that it's also about uh, data communicators, right? There, like right. I was getting that earlier, is that there is a community of really excited data communicators who have taken digital vi uh, visualization and and adapted it for uh, for for a pop culture society, right? Like there was a um, uh, there was a like a Tumblr that was like there was a whole like Tumblr community, it was an online community about like about charts who've turned into a bunch of books and and we need to bring them more in house about how, what did they see that they, that they can tell that connects with people, that tells a story. Um, when we did this, you know, this international chart day, we found, I found two things really interesting. It ended up being less about um, uh, explaining and bringing people into the world of needing to under, ha have, uh, digital data understanding and more about a celebration of these digital uh, data communicators. They really appreciated it. And the other thing is I found out how much uh, visual data communicators hate pie charts. Yeah. <laughs> right? like I, <laughs> I never really understood why. And the explanation is that if you're using a pie chart, you're not really explaining anything. If you have more than three slices to that pie, it becomes very uh, convoluted and not really a good job of transfer. And it, the only thing that's worse than a pie chart is a 3D pie chart because it does an even worse job of telling that story, right? And these are these are things that um, that we need, if we can bring these people in in to kind of help our our, our technical people um, through the lens of a good old fashioned kind of mark, pop culture marketing. I think that that would spread in a way that is organic, that is not just about sitting down and, and taking a course on, on you know, on, on, on Tableau or whatever the, the latest tech tool is. Right. No, that's that's very important. I uh, I mean, on the visualization thing, I, for when we founded the Innovation Lab and stood up the team, I, I like to quote uh, a, something attributed to St. Francis centuries ago, which was, he would say, preach the gospel always, but use words if necessary. So not making things simplistic like pie chart only, but trying to convey the complexity of things in an efficient manner. Yuri, that's our focus on in terms of what we're we're wanting to do using the digital platforms of today, being data driven and so on, and efficiently giving it, uh, providing it to you all, our, our clients, to operate at the 21st century mm -hmm. tempo that you're you're now in, right? But for us doing that, it feels like, or I've heard, but you can tell me, uh, one way or the other, I've heard that you know, other than that, you're just relegated to some issues are whatever the staffer can pull up in the top five hits of Google synthesized by lunch and delivered to the, so, you know, decision makers are, be, are, are being fed, but maybe not the best uh, things necessarily in all issues. You just described like a job description for a second year legislative assistant, right? Like that is exactly <laughs> what it is, right? 
uh, help me make this argument rather than what is what is what are the facts and figures behind the, the the issue that I'm trying to understand and we need to reshape that so that it's we are looking um, when we have a, a problem the solution is based on what we discover through understanding the data sets that are in front of us it's much more valuable much more interesting rather than than coming back to it later give me some data that will back up my point of view <laughs> yes exactly I'm going to turn to Jessica and then again throw it over. This is just, this is a very important, uh, it's a practical question, right? So for our audience, the key thing is, so what What about, what can I do now, right? We, we can talk about the trends, but we can also, it's like think globally, but act locally, right? So how do I uh, start to think about preparing myself now for this more uh, tech and data centered uh, auditing or oversight future? So this just goes right into what you're saying. How do we not, Gary, end up in that, you know, I Google something and, and deliver like this, the second year ledger system or something. So uh, Jessica, why don't you kick us off with uh, with that? And then I, I have no doubt Suzette will have some great things to say. Uh, Yuri, Bill, please jump in. Well, I think it would be also ways to increase efficiency um, and monitor performance quickly. But so some skills related to that would be reaching out also to people who are more analytically inclined uh, to talk to them about their process and, and what they think would data analysis would mean in terms of what project they're looking at. So it all comes, and, I, and it's a very broad, but I always go back to data literacy, understanding, knowing what you have and how you can use it and talking to some, if you don't know how you can use it, you could talk to some people to kind of uh, flesh out those ideas. T staying up to date on current um, technologies, that's like Yuri said, we talk about um, just Googling and looking at things and being part of um, email distributions, not only within the government, but outside in the private sector that will keep you updated on things. We also have a lot of, and within the Learning Center, we have a lot of um, tools that are available uh, to learn data science or just in general data analytics. So I think it's more about going out there and understanding the, um, what we have or learning what we have to increase your knowledge, both within GAO, within the government, and also in the private sector. Yeah. And I would jump in and say that uh, as for the experts on here who are who do have a technical background, who do who are building these tools to help Congress understand it, um, even when they are available, Congress feels a level of frustration that, that the tools that are available to them um, are, are not intuitive. And even sometimes the feeling that depending on where I go and enter that, that data set, putting in the same um, query will get me different results. And that is a, that is a, there's this feeling of anxiety when, when as a staffer, when you are dealing with this, with data that someone is going to be able to, able to easily disprove the data that you found, even though you thought it was you know, from a government site and pretty infallible. So there needs to be both intuitiveness in how it's accessed, but also just a, a trust in that you, they will be able to stand by the data and, and how they accessed it. So we need your help in, in, in creating the, 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 the access platforms and, and really backing up what we're able to get out of it. You hit on a key issue. I just just tell me real quick. Is do you you said the T word, which is trust and trust in government. Uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 such a critical thing in terms of just trying to and, and reinforce uh, from the, the the lowest level. You know, evidence based policy making, those sort of things, and uh, and that's a key challenge indeed. Especially because when the same technologies and analytics can help you drive toward. Uh, insights and, and so on and, and truth, other things can be used for disinformation. And, and, and that's that's a big challenge. Well, time. let me give you a, a little fun example. I'm not gonna name any names, but I've, I've been in meetings where I'm the one that who, who produced the data and I spent, and inevitably there's going to be some back of the napkin math. That's just the, the reality of data is that you are making a, a safe assumptions when you are trying to take the data that is available and turn it into a, a a, a narrative or a story that is supportive of the, the argument that you are making. Um, but I want, I've gone into meetings where people have looked at that data and based on their own internal assumptions, not based on actually looking at data, told me that there's no way that that is correct. 
In fact, it is so incorrect. You should be ashamed to have brought that in. And my boss, who is relying on me for that data, turns to you and says, you know, where did you get this data from? And I will tell you, as a as a second year legislative assistant, your your knees start to to tremble and you worry about your future <laughs> career prospects. But if you if you have a, an ability to 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 really dig through these things, you can stand by it. That happened to me. And I and and what's funny is that 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 remember the other person staffer came over to me and said, your dad is right, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> but that is that is the fear and terror that exists inside being that 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 junior staffer who doesn't you know who is who is trying to kind of access and trust and understand the data. Sure. Yeah, Tim, uh, I I I want to jump on Yuri's comment of uh, uh, very often if people don't like the outcome of the results, the first thing they'll do is either attack the process or the data, right? How did you get exactly. here yeah. or this source yeah. information wrong? It's kind of a human nature. But but back to I saw some questions in the chat and your question. Um, sometimes in my discussions, I use the tactic of reverse engineering mm -hmm. and, and literally say this is yeah. the outcome that, that we got to because and then share some of the insights of it was gathered in this way. It was used, you know, in for this. Th these are the processes around not all the weeds but just enough of the weeds to build, to your point, trust, especially yeah. if it's someone who um, you don't necessarily have a relationship or be, be highly selective in your data sources. Start with a set of, of, of trusted data that that member or that, that staff team sees frequently and they're comfortable with it, right? Because then you, you kind of have a, an advantage or a jump because they have some level of familiarity. And sometimes that means you have to do different kind of homework if you're trying to bring something. The other uh, tactic that I, that I love to use um, when I think the gap in explaining as long as, is share pre-reads. Share information that's been gathered before to make people feel comfortable. They may not understand it either. And in, in so many cases, they're supporting information, even if you're just recapping the process and how we got there and say, hey, you want to ask me about this before we get there. And, and those are just those are just all tactics, uh, practical tactics that anyone at any level can use with anyone, you know, at any level as you're trying to prepare that conversation. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I, I appreciate that, uh, Suzette. So um, I, I did just want to pause. There's a, a great comment from uh, our colleagues who are also doing, by the way, evidence-based policy making in their own. This is our our, our Dutch colleagues, uh, Mark Small and ours from the Netherlands Court of Audit. They have some work there. That's I commend that to you. Uh, but we have seen some other uh, things. It's great to have connectivity uh, both domestically in the U.S. and internationally with the oversight community on just how do you uh, what I call convert question to answer in, a, in an efficient manner, accurately, data data driven, resulting in trusted and, and more uh, virtuous policy outcomes and things like that. Um, think of the pandemic. We uh, in 2020 we had many briefings every day. You still had models, however in, in, imperfect they were. We were still going to make decisions on what do we do with this and that. That's that's my favorite example of saying, you know, the decisions aren't going to wait around. So, so many of them can't wait. And so we have to think differently in terms of, uh, of what we're doing. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to, uh, there's a question here in from uh, Jess is, is asking, let me just toss it to Bill. How does the federal government take you know, agile lessons? Because Bill, you mentioned Operation Warp Speed, a stunning success in that sense, right? It moved normally a 10 year process to 10 months. Um, and you know, to speed up vaccines. Of course, Congress is naturally going to ask, why don't we do 10 months all the time for our... so and it's the answer is more complicated. But just going back to your opening comments, Bill, about war speed and things, um, how can we take these agile lessons learned and sort of generalize them to other uh, you know, economic and innovation systems? You may be on mute, Bill, so I... Sorry, I think we need to build in an analytical piece after we, after we take each one of these steps. 
to really have a kind of a lessons learned process. Um, you know, the military does this after operations, but I think we're going to need to do it uh, more in a more encompassing kind of way across government to really kind of take the lessons learned and figure out, you know, what they how they bode for further or comparable kinds of efforts. We don't have that process locked in place, but I think, you know, GAO, for example, can play a very important kind of role in that analytical process. And obviously it's doing a fair amount of it already. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we, we are big fans of Agile. We're doing Agile implementing for our work ourselves. Uh, and then we also have an Agile uh, a, a best practices guide that we, we, we put out of our team. We're very proud of our, our group that does a lot of engineering sciences things there to, to help um, essentially uh, curate and develop uh, best practices ideas in this case in Agile. So I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, so one of the things I just wanted to turn to is, is the, Suzette, I'm just going to um, pull out on, on the, from the federal CIO perspective. In my opinion, you were, of course, the CIO. That is, you were kind of a CDO as well, the chief data officer. It was really cool to see a CIO uh, working in, this, uh, in, in a CDO or could speak like a CDO. And that, I think, was very important. It was recognizing the data as an asset. And uh, I put earlier in our chat, uh, uh, the, the, our team that had just done some of that oversight work on the improvements that we've seen, which is good. Uh, but um, really, when you think about uh, the data as an asset and then pivoting toward uh, the future, which is going to be AI-enabled uh, government services, those sort of things, uh, what are the key things that still uh, need to be done? Uh, you know, data governance is easy to say, but harder to do. You know, what, what are some of the things that I know you initiated, but things that need to have continued focus, particularly from the oversight community? Well, it, you know, Tim, kind of in, in sharing that, one of the reasons that I wanted to be very close to all of the activities is, as you all remember, we just implemented the chief data officer role as an outcome from evidence-based policy making and the data act and others. And, it was very important um, both to understand what the role needed to be and separate it you know, from other things that we already have, but ensure that we were clear on what we were hoping to achieve with every agency, not just getting people you know, in seats, but um, clarity around the actions. And, and, and the way that we did that and ensuring that those individuals were important contributors to their agency, because that's really what the law mm -hmm. was about was getting results. And the, um, the way that, uh, again, the way that we did that was taking that 124 person group of, of, of chief data officers um, and bringing them together and finding the common ground for both problems that we could solve as a whole and what was missing. Because in many cases, somebody was named to the chief data officer but in you know the, their own words, they say, "Well, I, I don't know that I have the skills. I or I can do some of that, but I'm also doing this other thing." As we looked to the future, we had to be much more robust in definition of expectations, in um, acquiring skill sets. Um, some folks, if if uh, I don't know who out here is following certain pieces of legislation, you know that on the federal agency side, we don't even actually have a chief data officer job family. I mean, or excuse me, a data scientist job, job, job series, right? That's job right. series. Yes. We we right. we we put it in different places. Um, we ran to to I think Bill used the word a couple of times, and Yuri used it not, and, and Jessica all data literacy. We ran mm -hmm. um, programs to not just you know for the technology staff, absolutely, but also for leaders at agencies to understand what does data driven mean. How do you work in an evidence-based environment? What does that mean? And you know, quite frankly, the some of the conversations were tougher with the business side than the technology side. Um, but to your question, we have to continue to build the talent. We have to continue to embed the disciplined processes in how we operate day to day or how we drive and plan technology change. And we have to make 
our form of communications, um, Yuri said communications, I heard someone else say translators, a couple of the um, questions in the chat were asking about learning. We have to make data driven conversations and data centric kind of part of our standard mode of communication so that we're building those different you know expectations and many times it starts with the top so when you have an agency head who prioritizes and helps drive it helps move the needle faster um but but i, I think the gao team has opportunity to to drive that expectation even in how conversations happen, you know, whether it's with members or with agencies. I would like to just jump into that too. I think that one thing I would hope that we get to a place on is that the data starts to look uh, more similar from agency to agency. And that's something that I think I want uh, con Congress and our committee to look at that the that, that data from BLS can be compared to data at the census in a much clearer and simpler way for Congress to, to understand and, and, and put up against one another. It, it's no longer acceptable um, for our government to say that this data set doesn't speak to this data set. I don't. I think that people are demanding quite a bit more from us. Um, and I think that, it, and I think the way to get there is by, by Congress setting out some guidelines with, with, uh, with support from experts. Um, I, I think that's the future of, 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 under, of data understanding um, for all of us. Thank you. Um, I did want to just mention, because Suzette, you mentioned the chief data officers, and again, thanks for all that great work and, and elevating that role. Um, we also have within SAA, but really for the institution, uh, our newest chief is our chief data scientist, uh, Taka Ariga, who recently in partnership with Steve, so we're going to hear from Steve in just a few minutes in, in his panel uh, as, as we uh, come to a close on this session. Uh, but uh, uh, Taka and Steve partnered together to put together a very important uh, accountability framework, accountability framework around artificial intelligence, how to look at that. Of course, the data governance is central to that, but also uh, the, the quality monitoring uh, and uh, the, the data engineering and the data science type pieces of things that are, that are important with that. But I'm going to just put that in the chat, if only to say, you know, as GA looks to its next uh, century, we are taking that. Uh, evidence-based posture with uh, a lot of uh, powerful data science, creating an environment in our innovation lab to de-risk things so that our, our clients don't have to have that risk. We can try and do that and put that and keep it within the frame of GAO's quality assurance framework, which is quite strong. And just like you said, Yuri, when it's wobbly knees time, GAO's experienced that before. You know, challenge the data, challenge the methods. That's why we have, and we do have a strong uh, quality metric system uh, here. So. Uh, if there are, let me just pause and see if the panelists, if you have any closing remarks, otherwise I'm going to close with a thank you all and uh, we're going to pivot to our next session, but let me pause here. Any final thoughts, comments, remarks, anything left unsaid? I, I would just always make the pitch that, you know, Congress is a, is a institution with, you know, all of its foibles that, that we should all be investing in and, and trying to help, um, do its job and its job is to represent and serve the American people. And um, we can only do that job if we, if, we, if we have the data to back up the decisions that we're making. And that is the future of, of legislating. The future of legislating is evidence-based legislating. And we need your help to get there. And GAO, Frank, GAO, CRS and CBO, as well as other agencies have been kind of helping us the whole way. And, and we're only gonna start asking more of you. So, you know, be ready for it and work with us. And we, we genuinely, uh, I appreciate you and all of the work that all of you do. It really does kind of, it does improve the product that we're putting together over here. And, and, and I don't think you're going to find a single staffer over here that doesn't, that it doesn't genuinely enjoy and appreciate um, these support agencies like, C, like CBO, CRS, and GAO. Um, they're always amazed by what is, by what is coming out. And they're always, and I know plenty of, of good entrepreneurial staffers who, uh, who are digging through reports, looking for recommendations that they can turn into policy. So it doesn't, it doesn't go away. You have good people who are real, who, who read your long reports that are meaningful, that impact the work that they're doing. And thanks, Yuri. And on behalf of GAO, thank you for that kind remark. It's, we, we really <laughs> do appreciate it. So yeah. uh, uh, 
Suzette, Bill, or uh, Jessica, any final comments? Yeah, thanks, thanks to everyone for their investment of time here today. Um, I, you know, as I've again watched the chat, there's been lots of resources and insights and things, you know, in that chat, and and just by being part of this conversation and, and um, making a, a thoughtful reflection on on what you heard, um, you are making that investment going forward and. I already said congratulations, but when Jean shared the diversity metrics of GAO and the fact uh, the accomplishments on uh, best places to work, that also says something about your leadership role, at, you know, across government in, in bringing differentiated thinking um, and, and and helping us all move forward. So thank you for that work. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Tim, and I'll I would just, like to. Uh, Tim, I'll just no, as a longtime health staffer and frequent user of, of GAO's capabilities, uh, they're really crucial. So thanks yeah. to this group for their focus on these issues. And I'll just close by saying, you know, the role of science and technology is gonna be more and more profound as we look ahead toward this future. It's gonna be more and more embedded in everything we kind of undertake and building the resources and capabilities to use those tools, but also to manage the new tasks that the tools will compel. I think it's going to be key. Yeah. And thanks. Uh, I'll just say thanks, Jessica, for being our young generation, rising up and saving our older generation, as, as it always sort of happens in cyclical form. So we appreciate what you're doing. Um, we're out of time. So I'm going to uh, uh, just um, close and say thank you, uh, Jessica, uh, Bill, and Suzette, and Yuri for your tremendous uh, work and then your time here today to uh, to talk about these particular issues. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to hear um, from uh, Representative uh, Robin Kelly, uh, as well as former Congressman Will Hurd. Uh, I'm going to pass it right now uh, to my colleague Steve Sanford, uh, who's uh, passing the baton. He's going to carry forward and lead us into those comments and then into his panel. So, Steve, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everyone who participated in the uh, previous panel. Uh, very happy uh, to be continuing the conversation today. I think uh, this first panel ended on a, uh, an apt uh, note talking about uh, GAO's service to the Congress. Uh, so we're very pleased um, to hear shortly from uh, current and former members of Congress uh, taking stock of some of the issues we're talking about today. Uh, then following that, I'm very excited. We're going to um, go into our second panel where we're going to have uh, leading uh, global thinkers and leaders in the field of foresight uh, strategy and global affairs, uh, talking about uh, some important issues moving forward in terms of the global context we find ourselves operating in and the importance that plays in the mission uh, that GAO has uh, going forward into the next century of our operations. Uh, so before we get to that second panel, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Sherelle Griziak. Sherelle is a uh, member of our team, is the uh, assistant director for the Center for Strategic Foresight and uh, has been a, a valuable member of our team in terms of uh, strategic planning and bringing foresight thinking to GAO and is a leading um, thinker and practitioner of foresight and future studies. And uh, Sherelle will introduce our uh, uh, congressional uh, remarks today. Sherelle, over to you. Thank you, Steve. What an honor to be here today on such a momentous occasion. I would like to take the opportunity today to share a bit about the Center. The Center for Strategic Foresight was established at GAO to identify emerging issues, challenges, and opportunities to help GAO fulfill its mission to support the United States Congress in making the federal government more efficient and effective. The center launched in 2018 with an inaugural cohort of nine resident fellows. These fellows are experts in foresight and future thinking from around the world. Collectively, the fellows backgrounds span government, the private sector, non-governmental organizations, academia, and international organizations. And today you'll be hearing from a few of them. The Center for Strategic Foresight is a unique entity in the United States government and reflects the full scope of GAO's oversight mission across the entire federal enterprise. The center embodies GAO's core values of independent, nonpartisan, and fact-based analysis 
and works closely with all of GEO's mission teams. Today, as part of the centennial celebration, we have remarks from both US Representative Robin Kelly and Representative Will Hurd, who will echo the importance of foresight and the value GAO can offer in making government more effective and efficient. First, I will read Ms. Robin Kelly, the US Representative for Illinois, second congressional district who has provided us with her remarks. In, it is hard to know what Congress will need to focus on in 100 years, but our responsibility to oversee the executive branch will continue, even as agencies become more complex in their operations. The federal government is already using technologies such as facial recognition, AI, and machine learning in a myriad of applications that affect American citizens every day as they visit a doctor, apply for a mortgage walk through an airport, or many other day-to-day -day activities. It is our responsibility to provide oversight and ensure that agencies are using these technologies appropriately, especially when their use is invisible, yet omnipresent and interwoven into many different programs impacting the people we serve. This is a critical responsibility for Congress and for GAO knowing that the pace of technological change will only continue to increase. GAO, and especially its Center for Strategic Foresight, the Science and Technology Assessment and Analytics team, and the Innovation Lab play a critical role in helping Congress to navigate these complex challenges moving forward. Next, we will hear from some pre-recorded remarks from Will Hurd, the US, um, former US representative, Texas 23rd Congressional District. Please enjoy the video. Howdy, everyone. I'm former Congressman Will Hurd, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual panel of science and technology thought leaders who are going to grapple with big questions like, how is GAO preparing to meet Congress's oversight needs for the next 100 years? And what will the oversight needs of Congress be in the future? Since being out of Congress and advising technology companies, who have a national security application, I have seen how tomorrow's technologies like hypersonic weapons, cryptocurrencies, artificial general intelligence, and quantum computing are quickly becoming today's reality. And this is not just true here in America, but around the world. How do we make sense of technologies like these quickly enough? And then how do we use them to enable security, innovation, and competitiveness for our citizens? These are the kinds of questions that will have to be answered to keep America as the global leader of advanced technology. Foresight is absolutely critical to addressing these issues, especially since we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution, where the technological explosion we are going to see in the next few decades is going to make the technological change of the last 47 years since the introduction of the personal computer look insignificant. This tech explosion will bring a substantial amount of pressure on our government to modernize. This need to modernize will require us to forecast over many time horizons. Forecasting out a few months is important, but forecasting out a few years or even a few decades is the strategic long game that we must win. This is what GAO has been doing for 100 years, and this is what GAO, and especially its Center for Strategic Foresight, its STAA team, and the Innovation Lab will need to do for another 100 years. Enjoy this conversation on how we will all need to help Congress navigate these complex challenges so that this century stays the American century. Thank you, Sherelle. And uh, I wanted to thank um, former member of Congress, Will Hurd, and also Representative Kelly for uh, providing uh, input into our event today. Um, we are very excited now to uh, embark on the second part of today's event bringing in our second panel, uh, where we're going to talk more broadly about um, uh, foresight and the trends affecting government and society, um, the, global offense, uh, uh, the global trends affecting um, all of us, and um, especially thinking about how the uh, intersection of uh, things like global financial markets, uh, climate issues, uh, trade and supply chains, 
um, health issues, of course, like a pandemic and the marketplace of ideas, um, which are all international in scope and yet uh, greatly affect the domestic context in which uh, both GAO and the Congress uh, operate. We are very fortunate at GAO as part of our Center for Strategic Foresight to have a number of fellows who are uh, experts in uh, foresight, futures thinking, strategy, and uh, leadership. And, and foresight has been an important part of the DNA of GAO for a long time. Uh, we've had futurists on our advisory boards. We have engaged in uh, foresight practices as a way to inform our strategic planning efforts for uh, several decades. And we are uh, an office uh, that, that I lead where foresight and strategic planning are uh, married up and work in concert, um, not only to help the agency with its planning, but also to help us with our operations and to assist the uh, GAO mission team to do all of the analytical work on behalf of Congress. So I'm very excited to um, welcome the uh, next panel uh, as we continue today's conversation. Um, we are joined by um, Christel Vander Elst, who is um, uh, CEO of the Global Foresight Group. Uh, Jens Wandel, who is a um, uh, special advisor to the UN Secretary General on Reforms. Uh, also, uh, we have a Angela Wilkinson, who is the current CEO and Sixth Secretary General of the World Energy Council. And finally, we're joined by uh, GAO's own uh, Jason Baer, who is a director in our international affairs and trade team. Uh, so I want to give everyone a chance to make some uh, introductory remarks. Uh, we'll start with um, uh, Christelle, and then we will um, proceed through the panel and uh, then have a uh, kind of convened discussion where we all get to uh, dive into the, the issues in a bit more detail. So first, uh, Christelle, welcome, and thank you for joining us uh, on this centennial event. Uh, over to you. Hello, Stephen. Um, hello, everyone, and congratulations on the occasion of, uh, you know, the, the 100th year. So yes, yeah, so to, to talk a bit about, um, you know, how, how do we achieve actually that aspirational future? How, what are some of the ways we could do that? And indeed, it's, you know, as, as you come just out of 100 years and you go into 100 more years, which will probably even the change, the speed of change will be a lot higher. It's, it's a really important question to think, how do we achieve those very long term goals that you're actually pursuing when you're kind of shaping a society? Um, with, with the fact that it's constantly changing, because in the past, um, in the past hundred years, probably, or in a big part of that, uh, a lot of time when we think about the future and the decisions about the future, we kind of use what we know, but that is built up in the past, and then we use that type kind of forecast on why, what might happen, and we put some imagination on that to do some visioning. But this kind of tools that we've been using a lot, and they have worked in certain sense, but it gives us a sense of like agency and control and certainty. But in these times of really quick change, none of this actually uh, works, certainly not in a crisis like the pandemic. So what we're seeing is actually that um, there's some other ways to deal with that that people use. Is so if we can't know what tomorrow is going to be about, and um, it, it's going to be really difficult to to forecast um, why even try then? And then you see people kind of, you know, going uh, one day at a time. And you also see other reactions um, in, in times of crisis and big change, which is to worry a lot, to ask a lot like, oh, what if, what if, what if, but in quite an unstructured manner. And, and none of this also seems to work because you get a lot of knee-jerk reactions, which we've seen also through the crisis, obviously. Um, and, and you don't have good decision making. So, and it's really a problem when the stakes are big, obviously, like, like they are now. And so that's why a center like yours uh, on strategic foresight is so important, obviously, because it really allows us to, to kind of take a more strategic approach to the future, to really work with those uncertainties, think through some of these um, circumstances that we might be facing through these futures we might want to create and, and, and being able to bring that actually back to current day decision making. So it's super important. And um, so, so you see these capacities of foresight actually being the, um, 
beefed up, I would say, in, in a lot of public institutions, uh, such as your own also. And, and usually it's with the perspective of kind of what might happen, right? How might the play, uh, future play out? What new technologies might we see? What kind of new uh, economic circumstances might we see? And so that we can actually start to think about how the world might play out, how it might play out differently than what we're expecting so that we can start to prepare for different scenarios. Because as you know, like while a company, they might uh, kind of go under if they made that, that bet about the future, that's usually not an option that public institutions have. They are to be a lot more prudent and while scaling up kind of new initiatives and, and uh, well, while scaling up policies and initiatives might be easy when you find yourself in a situation of quick um, change um, or crisis, uh, there's a big policy risk, right? That you get it wrong and you, because you have to invent, you have to adapt, you have to scale everything at the same time. So doing that foresight of really thinking about what might happen and how will we react when that happens is really crucial. But I think there's two other things that are really important. And that's the fact that, um, and, and if we see these evolutions also, and probably when you go forward, uh, you, you'll, you are doing this already and you're continuing working on that it's really to bring that future thinking that foresight that understanding about what might happen in the future to bring that down and hardwire that in policy decision making so so that it's not just a thought experiment of, of thinking uh, about what might happen but it is really driving current day decision making so that hardwiring is very important and we see a lot more efforts around that um, kind of in public institutions but then I, I think an, uh, another point is um, very often we use foresight in thinking what might happen, but we don't see a lot of work actually being done. Um, I, I don't see that at least in public institutions where we are thinking about what are some of those futures that are uh, being created. And I think some of the, the speakers before have already indicated there's a lot of work around science and technology and how that might actually uh, move forward. And, and very often I find those conversations are about technical feasibility, but not necessarily about what we want as a society to happen. So what are some of those intended unintended consequences? What do we want? What do we hope for? What are we afraid of? And kind of bringing that kind of home. And then maybe one last point is, um, because you talked about aspirational future in the session description, how do we achieve these aspirational futures? Well, the question is for me then also, who, whose aspirational um, futures are we kind of talking about? Um, because we, we have, of course, a concept of, of, of democracy and public institutions, uh, but ultimately a lot of the new evolutions or what might happen in the future, um, we haven't really thought of through that as a society. So there's a lot of stakeholders involved. There's a lot of changes, profound changes that are happening and transformations that will happen in the coming 10 to 20 years. And I think most of the people don't have the luxury or, or the time or the opportunity to really think through what that might mean. And so if when moving forward and using strategic foresight in a context like yours or in public institutions, I think it's really crucial to bring the different stakeholders together and to really think through what that might be in the future so that we have actually aspirational futures that you know, society can actually stand behind and they're kind of desired by all. So I, I will leave it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christelle. Appreciate that perspective. Um, and uh, I think we're going to dig in a little bit more into this whole uh, stakeholder question a little bit more in, in the panel discussion. So thank you for, for teeing that up. Um, next, I'd like to turn to um, Jens Wandel for his uh, introductory remarks. Uh, as I mentioned, Jens, um, former Assistant Secretary General at the uh, UN uh, DP, and um, also is currently uh, serving as a uh, chair of uh, Sustainable Now. And uh, we're very glad to have you uh, with us today. Uh, Jens, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much for having me. Um, looking ahead using foresight, uh, I think accountability to society and in government will depend significantly on how we understand our economy and what constitutes the future progress. Some will say sustainability or sustainable growth. <clears throat> in a sense, as we'll be here from the earlier panel, what data will we be looking at? And from my perspective, uh, and to quote the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, now is the time to correct 
the blind spot on how we measure economic prosperity and progress towards sustainability. It's well known that, uh, that when economic activities come at the expense of, of, of people or planet, then we are left with an incomplete picture of these uh, true growth of or true cost of economic growth. As currently measured across domestic, domestic product, it really fails to capture the human and environmental you can even say destruction of economic economics. And just as important, GDP underreports some of the positive consequences uh, of specific investments, again, both in people and in planetary issues. So I think putting you can the long view on, central to accountability and the effective societal stewardship, that will be new measures to complement GDP. So people can get a full understanding of the impact of both the public and private economic activities and how we can do better to support people and planet. And from a global perspective, uh, I would venture that getting these uh, GDP complementary measures right, that will constitute a new capacity that well-functioning societies they can use to achieve new levels of prosperity on a sustainable basis. So let me just turn to what does this mean? Uh, the, the, the GDP of the future, it is based on the current, you can say flow oriented GDP, but we need to complement it by a new set of measures that capture two things, both the negative externalities and the positive ones. So on the negative side, we know climate crisis and uh, we need to understand, in a sense, the value of current economic activity and then factor in future minus, uh, future downside. And today, financial macroeconomic models, they do not really reflect that type of relationship. And we need to adjust that so we understand the consequences now of what we are doing. And we need to, in a sense, move the future into the present. The other thing which is also not discussed very often is the focus on positive externalities. One such area is investment in people. Globally, it is well established that both bringing men and women into the economy has been a strong force in economic growth and societies that systematically today are able to include all its talent in its economy, they tend to be successful. However, we do not really capture these positive externalities in our macroeconomic growth analysis. And that means from my perspective, we are undervaluing this type of investments. So positive externalities, they need to be understood and analyzed correctly and should show up as growth in a future GDP model. Now, more broadly, it also means that this, you can call it enhanced GDP, it would correctly measure sustainable growth from various sources. Some of them have been discussed, both the general technology, uh, technological innovation, but growth can also come from inclusion of all groups in society. It can come from circular economy, where we decouple growth from resources. And then it can all be underpinned by renewable energy. Then another point I wanted to make is that, of course, human beings are not saints. So, so globally, we will probably continue to end up in situations such as climate change, or the current biodiversity crisis, or even in conflict. Which, which requires, uh, or we should, we should understand that we need to bring more explicit risk analysis into the current day GDP discussions. So it's clear if our economic activities planned and actual, it reduces our risks or increases our risks. Generally, our record is mixed um, with ozone depleting substances we globally, we did react on science and risk and took global action that actually mitigated this issue. However, clearly in retrospect, 
the world had access to reliable science and prediction models for climate change back in the early 90s. And still it's only maybe over the last 10 years that we have reacted at a level more commensurate with the actual threat. Looking ahead, the risk horizon needs to, from where I stand, play a more integrated role in our understanding of value, economics, and financial flow. And let me just take one example. And that is the current utilization, both you can say public and private, of space. It's, it's, a, pop, it's a possible test case to establish whether we have really learned something from the climate crisis and whether we have an increasing capability to react now to things we can see in front of us. Very simply put, with the density of objects that we put into space, as the density increases, so does the likelihood of collisions. And each collision will create further debris in a chain reaction, potentially rendering space unusable for generations. Extrapolations today are available. And it, it points that if we intervene now, we can secure space, avoid pollution of space, and, and make sure it's available for future generations for economic and public purpose. And the question is, can we bring this kind of foresight into current economic thinking? So we don't only take the net value of getting the space used, but we also start, what is the impact of us using the space this way for future generations? So let me, Stephen, let me just conclude my remarks by saying that looking ahead and effective accountability is one that is connected with a new enhanced GDP or a beyond current GDP set of metrics that both reflects the negative as well as the positive externalities in the economy. And it's also an accountability that uses foresight to understand future risks and then bring mitigation strategies into the current. So societies that aim to deliver growth, they do it in such a way that is compatible with an improved version of the planet and making that improved version of the planet available to future generations. So let me leave it at that and hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jens. Appreciate those, those comments and, and that perspective. Um, I, I think uh, this concept of the uh, uh, positive externalities you talked about will, will also be an, an important concept as we continue the conversation, um, as well as the type of uh, risk horizon uh, that, that we're all looking at. Um, so thank you for those remarks. Uh, I have the pleasure now of introducing uh, Angela Wilkinson, who, as I mentioned, is the uh, current Secretary General of the World Energy Council and has been a leading global expert um, working on a number of national and international multi-stakeholder initiatives covering uh, the economy, energy issues, climate and sustainable development, uh, including with the OECD. So Angela, thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Congratulations on your 100th centenary anniversary. There aren't many organizations that last 100 years these days. And I'm pleased to say that we celebrate our centenary next year. So congratulations. Let's have a celebration together. Um, what I'm going to do is in my opening remarks is I'd just like to touch a little bit on what Crystal has started about the nature of the future. And also resonate a bit with what Jens has, uh, has been talking about in terms of the challenges ahead. And, you know, we humans live in an era of globally connected challenges and existential crisis. And many people are looking at the future with fear and hopelessness. We're trying to avoid a sense of future crisis and catastrophe whilst trying to work out how to recover from crisis and catastrophe today. And I will touch upon you know, issues such as climate change and the importance of energy systems as we progress forward. How can we build a better future is a question that many governments and societies are asking themselves across the world today. How do we build a future now for those who are still living in energy poverty whilst at the same time nurturing a healthy planet 
how do we avoid a return to an era of of um, strife and war and how do we coexist in peace? These are very big future questions. And although the human beings spend a lot of their mental time thinking about the future, we seldom stop to consider how we think about the future and the nature of future thinking itself. And Crystal was drawing out the differences between forecasting and foresight. And for, for a foresighter, the future is always first and only a fiction, and the future we imagine shapes our understanding of reality. If we imagine better futures are possible, we make different decisions in the present. So it's important to, to reflect on the not just the data-centric future, but also our storytelling and imaginative future, if we really want to get ahead of today's connected challenges and create better. I want to look back 100 years. I'm going to look back 100 years, not in terms of the, 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 your history, but I'm going to look back 100 years in the history of energy, just to try and draw out some comparisons about looking at the future. When we started up 100 years ago, similar to yourselves, the world was in an era that we called energy for peace. It was about peaceful coexistence of, na of nations, the community of nations, and about the technologies required to exploit the resources that would lift people out of poverty, about the use of, of coal, oil and gas in order to save forests, in order to save whales, in order to improve people's livelihoods. It might feel impossible to think that way now, but that was the great hope then. Since then, we've moved through a period of energy for prosperity, another era of energy transition. And this was an era in which we have seen the increasing electrification of the world. We've started to look at the decentralization of energy and the rise of energy services. And we've started to think about energy in terms of not just resources, but in terms of numbers and pictures. And today, we're living in a different era of energy for people and planet. There are many things of people and planet. And we have to think not about the era of prosperity, where energy was the, where we were measuring things and we were thinking about energy for growth and the interconnectedness of quantity, we are now thinking about energy for people and planet and the challenges of health and the interconnectedness of quality. And for that, we're not just working with data and data visualization, we're also working with our quality of storytelling and our ability to expose and question fundamental assumptions about the way the world works. When I look to the next hundred years, I want to come to the US itself and talk a little bit about how we can imagine alternative futures to help us think about what reality are we in and what are the decisions today that will live in those futures and how do we stress test whether they're going to be effective or ineffective. So I went and looked around the US and I went on to the US National Intelligence Council's website and I found there are five scenarios now coming out of the US NIC on um, the future of the world. And fascinating they are. There are five scenarios, the renaissance of democracies, a world of drift, competitive coexistence, separate silos, tragedy and mobilization. And what's fascinating about these scenarios is when we look at the underlying framework and assumptions of them, what's clearly coming through is the challenges of whether we're going to have global rules or not live by global rules and have chaos, and whether we're going to manage our affairs as top down or as bottom up, and whether we're going to be able to get ahead of the challenges of digitization, which is a double-edged sword it's no longer technology is giving us just solutions. It's also creating new problems. And whether we're actually going to navigate through these new dynamics of confrontation, cooperation, and competition. So 
one of the things that we're learning to do as policy makers and as decision makers is to live in a world in which we have the certainty of uncertainty. And we're trying to learn to work with new approaches and principles, not just of rethinking progress, but what I would call realistic hope. And the five principles of realistic hope are about diversity. Who is in the room that's salient to the decisions and the plans on the table? Dialogue, how are they interacting? Experimentation, what are they going to do together? Systems thinking, in which context are they approaching the problem? And futures framing relates to the purpose of co-creating a future that's different to the present. And this, these principles are the principles that we need to build into anticipatory as well as agile policy and planning. Let me stop there, Steve and Stephen, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. I, I like uh, that finishing note of uh, anticipatory and, and agile policy making um, as, as a kind of uh, uh, watchword for us as, as we move through the conversation. Um, I'm happy now to introduce Jason Baer, who is Director for International Affairs and Trade at GAO, where he leads um, efforts to provide uh, nonpartisan and fact-based analysis for the US Congress as part of GAO's core mission. Uh, Jason, over to you. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for uh, for this tremendous honor. It's, it's a great honor to be uh, the last presenter at the last event celebrating GAO's illustrious 100-year uh, history. Um, it, it is perhaps an equally great honor to be a part of this esteemed panel. Um, when, when Steve first asked me uh, to consider participating you know, I racked my brain for a minute and, you know, I, among this group of, of incredibly um, knowledgeable uh, people on the panel, I, I said, you know, I'm not quite sure that I, I belong here. Probably the best uh, credential that I have in terms of being a futurist is, is I, I've taken my kids to Disney World a few times and we all really enjoy Tomorrowland, but that doesn't exactly qualify me to be on the panel. Um, but, you know, when I thought about it, who am I? I'm not a futurist, but I am a professional auditor. And I think the message that I want everybody to take away here is that we as auditors can help demonstrably improve agencies' long-term planning as well as their ability to address the challenges of the future that you've been hearing about so much over the last two panels by helping to conduct some prospective analysis. That's where we can really make a positive contribution to shaping what the futures look like. To get to that, I really have just got a, a couple of high level points. You know, the first is when we think about, you know, the federal government writ large, especially the, fed, especially the federal agencies responsible for implementing all the programs and activities that we look at, it's undeniable that they have a number of challenges to effectively doing long term planning. And I think to, the, to this audience, none of these is going to be a surprise, but it probably makes sense to just walk through them so that you understand, you know, the depth and the breadth of the challenges that, that a lot of these agencies face. And then we can move on and talk about the role that we can play. You know, first and foremost, there is, of course, going to be a constant tension between for these agencies between dedicating resources to current needs and priorities and preparing for the future. It's inescapable. What gets them tripped up often is there's always also going to be something urgent that is distracting the agencies and perhaps their leadership from the efforts that they have ongoing to plan for the future. You know, you think about a federal agency, they're obviously headed by cabinet secretaries who provide, you know, the overall strategic direction. They often serve for, I think, on average, about three years. And then the political appointees who serve under them, whether they be deputy secretaries, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, they are often serving for less time. And so you have this instability there and, and the shorter time horizons that they're looking at in terms of their tenure there. You combine that with the fact that funding is appropriated to agencies on an annual basis. And so agencies are in a position where they're concurrently executing the funds that they've just been given, as well as either developing or supporting the next year's budget request. This puts them in a really, really difficult situation. And it creates situations where even when they are doing some long-term planning, maybe they're not thinking about things as comprehensively as they need to. So how does this kind of show up in the real world? As Steve said as an in my introduction, I, I cover international issues. I 
do a lot of work with the State Department. So I'll give you uh, kind of a relatively contemporary example. Following the horrible bombings of, of the US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998, the State Department uh, decided that they needed to get US diplomatic personnel overseas into safer, more secure facilities. And they embarked in a strategic effort to build those new facilities to make sure that US personnel were gonna be safe. It's a, it's a massive building program. It's gonna take decades to complete and tens of billions of dollars. And they, along with congressional support, have put in the resources needed to build a lot of new embassies. What we found most recently is when we look at where they are, they're not paying as much attention to the maintenance side. They're putting a lot of attention on getting the new buildings built, but the funding for the maintenance had essentially flatlined. And so as a result, they had about a quarter of their facilities that were in poor condition. They had about $3 billion in deferred maintenance, which had developed a huge backlog. And at current funding levels, it would take them about 30 years to address all of that backlog. And so in some ways they were being strategic, but they had to comprehensively think not just about the new buildings that they were building, some of which, oh, by the way, are 20 years old now, they have to take care of what they already have and they need to look at the, the whole property picture um, writ large. But let me bridge for a minute and, and talk about the second key point, which I think is, is an important takeaway. And that's that we as auditors have a really key role in helping shape the future for the federal government. And that is in conducting prospective analysis. And let me just pause for a minute here and say, I know there's a lot of you in the audience um, in, uh, across the audit community. And, and I am speaking to you know, my colleagues at GAO or folks in the inspector general community, state auditors, the supreme audit institutions of other countries, the internal oversight bodies of multilateral institutions. I think what I'm saying is gonna be true for all of us. And while we are certainly known for the high quality and insightful products that we put out that are financial audits or internal control reviews or our effectiveness and efficiency audits, I wanna remind you prospective analysis is another type of performance audit. For those of you who are policy wonks out there, if you wanna go look it up, you can look in paragraph 1.26 of the yellow book. You'll find it there. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to do prospective analysis, um, let's just talk for a minute about kind of what that is and what, what the yellow book lays out. Um, really, it's about drawing conclusions based on kind of a variety of, of opportunities. It could be as simple as looking at programmer policy alternatives, including doing some forecasting or looking at the outcomes under some various assumptions. Or it could be about looking at policy or legislative proposals, including identifying and then laying out advantages, disadvantages, um, and stakeholder views on potential alternatives. Or it could be about digging into budgets and agency forecasts to confirm that they're based on assumptions that are realistic about what the expected future is going to look like, or that there are valid understandings of what stakeholders and management might do to respond to future events. So these are all the kinds of things that we can do even in the performance audit context. So let's talk for a minute about kind of potential real world applications. Again, I'm gonna fall back on my experience looking at the State Department um, that issues millions of passports to US citizens and uh, visas uh, to citizens of foreign countries to travel to the United States every year. This is a, a process that we charge fees for, and historically, those fees have more than covered the cost of, of doing the, um, the processes that I've talked about. That worked until the pandemic hit, um, when, of course, we all know there was a dramatic decline in international travel, both Americans needing passports to travel abroad and, and foreigners looking to come to the United States. And so they had this tremendous fiscal crisis where their opportunities are to look at what's the range of tools in the, to in the toolbox for the State Department and Congress to address these kinds of issues. You know, where might there be opportunities to adjust fees? Where might the State Department need additional legislative authorities? Where might they need to think creatively about how they're approaching um, how to handle the entire process? What opportunities do they have for cost savings? If we can look comprehensively at those things and allow policymakers to have fully informed um, information space that they can draw from to make those challenging policy decisions, then we've truly provided value to Congress and the American people. 
let me kind of close by addressing two additional questions. You know, one is kind of why do Congress and the executive branch need this kind of analysis from us as auditors? I think the answer is, is simple, but it's twofold. First, the problems that US agencies are facing are getting more complex, not less. On the first panel, you talked, you know, you heard a lot about science, technology, data, all these things are becoming, making the world more challenging, more complex to deal with. The second part of this is solving really difficult and maybe sometimes intractable policy problems inherently is going to involve trade-offs. And policymakers have to have a clear sense of what the range of options are to make informed and, and good choices about those. The second question just to close with is kind of why is it that we as auditors are positioned to provide this kind of perspective analysis? Well, the first is in our context, Congress is flooded with information. You know, they get information all the time. If anything, maybe they have too much information on some issues and they've got to sort through it. I mean, I think in the first panel, we heard about how, you know, folks on the Hill, you know, you get five minutes to Google and, and, and synthesize information. What they need though is objectivity. And that's what we as auditors can provide because with that objectivity comes credibility and reliability. And that's where we can provide value in make, helping them make informed decisions. I think the second part of, of the reason that we're really well positioned is, you know, frankly, a kind of a self-promoting one in the GAO context. And it's about expertise. And, and this is true at GAO. And I know it's true at a lot of other audit organizations. You know, we're blessed to have wonderful access to tremendous methodologists and statisticians and economists, legal analysts, and, and all the technologists that you heard about on the first panel. This is where we really can bring these resources to bear to help Congress and the executive branch as they have to confront these issues. And so I guess I, I would just, and by saying now, certainly more than ever, um, policymakers across the government, as well as in national governments around the globe and multilateral institutions are gonna benefit from perspective analysis as they have to make really difficult policy decisions. We as auditors are really well positioned to provide valuable insights to them, especially on some of the complex issues that they face. But we can do that if we bring to bear the same kind of rigor and objectivity that we bring to our other types of performance audits that we're, we're very, very comfortable doing. And so I guess returning to the theme of today's panel, that's my aspiration for the next year, uh, next hundred years for GAO and the audit community, that we can really improve prospective analysis. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Steve. Thank you so much, Jason. Appreciate that uh, perspective. You know, something you, you talked about um, especially resonated with me when I think about um, some concepts in design thinking. I'm, I'm both a student and a fan of design thinking and human-centered design. And one of the key phrases in that practice is, is to ask, how might we? And I think that's a phrase, that's a question that um, too often does not appear in the context of public policy discussions uh, when thinking about um, the execution of, of uh, public sector uh, programs and activities. And, and so I would um, call on all of us who are uh, at GAO and listening today you know, to think about as we embark on the next century, that phrase, how might we, and, and where that's uh, applicable uh, across everything that we do. So thank you for those comments, Jason. I invite all the panelists now to turn on their cameras um, and uh, join for a group discussion. It, one of the um, things I would really like us to explore uh, generally as a panel is, is looking at you know, what are some of the global trends um, that are going to be affecting us, especially in, in the, uh, our context as um, an agency providing um, analysis to um, Congress. Um, what are um, some of the things that forward-looking, that agile, best practices organizations um, are doing to respond to the current sets of challenges and opportunities uh, facing us, um, and especially the, the, you know, the future opportunities and challenges facing us. And finally, what is the role that foresight can play in, in making all of that happen and, and why foresight as a, as a practice and um, as, as an idea is, is so important to making progress in these areas. So I'll, I'll start with concretely asking um, uh, Christelle uh, if you could kick us off. 
uh, you know, your thoughts on what are some of the major drivers you are seeing, um, you know, globally that over the next five, 10, 20 years are going to be key factors as organizations and their leaders um, are going to need to be aware of and consider as, as they chart a path forward. Thank you for that, Stephen. Yeah, I, that's plentiful, of course. Um, but but uh, so I'll, I'll name a few that I think are really important. Obviously, we, we, we are still in the pandemic and so the control of the virus, um, although we might have hoped this was going to go away quite uh, some people might have hoped it was going to go away quite easily. It, it will not. So we're going to have to kind of learn um, to live more in a, in, in a world of crisis response. Also with climate change coming, um, uh, it's going to become more important and an and extreme event. So, so I think it's going to be important that we think about like, how do we live more in a world of kind of emergencies, to say so. And so what does that mean actually in, in terms of how governments uh, and public institutions and, and private organizations, et cetera, function, because it will have a huge impact, obviously, on the economy, on inequality, on trade, on, 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 on value chains, et cetera. So um, another one is like really the digitization of the economy. I know it is not new, like there's a lot of digitization that happens, but if we look forward um, over the next 10, 15 years, we will see, I think, tremendous like change still, because we have really this new, um, to, you know, infrastructure, economic infrastructure uh, coming up with a lot of technologies you, that were mentioned before um, being explored in the innovation lab, like blockchain, artificial intelligence, etc. But when it all combines and matures, your economy will look a lot, a whole lot different. But more importantly, I mean, additionally, we see a lot of, um, it was also referred to by um, the Congress as, as Spoke to uh, the, the person who spoke from the Congress. Like we have a lot more in the building environment. Um, being, you know, the Internet of Things is coming, becoming a lot more. Even if it's invisible, still it's becoming a lot more pervasive in our lives. And on top of that, we see that we're really at the at the beginning of bio digital convergence. At, at that revolution where the digital and the biology is really coming together. Um, and it will change industries. It's not just a health uh, story. It's also about energy, a lot of industries, security issues. And so by consequence, uh, what we'll see is that there's a lot of industries that will change. There's a lot of opportunities that are gonna be created to solve some of the really difficult challenges we're facing as a, as a world. But, but it's also gonna change what type of resources hold value. And that's where you're going to see a lot of competition and, 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 and innovation and some of that um, industrial policy uh, competition coming up, obviously. Um, but we're also going to see an exponential growth, I think, in ethical issues um, by consequence. Of course, uh, climate change, evolution of ecosystems, whether we're going to finally think about really living in the carrying capacity of our planetary ecosystems is going to matter tremendously because in the next you know 10 to 15 years we'll see start to see tremendous migration um you know food water insecurity political instability very important also but i think on, in the bottom of all this like underlaying all this which i think is i think about a lot and and i don't have an idea about how it will really well i, I hope we're not going to go into a bad future on that one but it's kind of more in the way i think what's really profoundly important is how you relate to each other like whether it's between individuals or groups of society or between nations we're seeing a lot of changes happening there and i think COVID has brought out and made a lot of things transparent about kind of people's priorities and how we relate, how important social connections are, but how important self-interest is also, um, the vulnerabilities in society. And so, so kind of the way it showed also, I think that the way we now make decisions and our what our behaviors are based on is, is vastly different. We have a competing, very different and competing worldviews uh, uh, happening for the moment. And, and I think it brought it all out. And, and we saw that also at the global governance level, obviously, which seems to be at the crossroads. Um, and all of this will change kind of, you know, how markets work, how norms are set, our capacity to respond to some of those really big challenges that we're talking about. It will determine how coherent we can be about these aspirational futures, what we actually want to create, uh, what opportunities we want to take, 
what some people might think is uh, an amazing progress and, and, and something to want to achieve. Some other people might be completely opposite opinions about that. So how do you create actually that, those futures and how are you accountable for that? And so, I mean, I, I, it's been mentioned before, I, I, I very much think we, um, if you bring all this together, there is this back, big question that we might be going into a world of like high technology driven strategic competition between different spheres of influence uh, from some very powerful economic and political nations, let's call it like that. Where you would where you would, might end up actually with a lot of innovation, but that innovation is uh, used uh, competitively in ecosystems that don't necessarily interconnect or interoperable, and that we might come with some some type of suboptimal kind of uh, kind of world. And my question is, how do we, you know, make sure that we're actually achieving some of those big transformation that the world needs in a very coherent, peaceful way? Um, is, is what I would think one of the major things is that should be on our mind. Yeah. Thank you, Christelle. Um, I, I think you know, you, you've certainly you know, covered a lot of uh, important ground there. I, I think this idea of how we relate to one another is a, a really important one that uh, maybe doesn't get um, talked about as much alongside all the other trends. So I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you, you pointed that one out. Um, uh, as uh, maybe the rest of the panelists start to collect their thoughts on this question. I do want to encourage uh, the audience uh, who's joining us today, if you have questions uh, that you'd like to tee up to the panel, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and those questions will make their way to me and we can uh, uh, put them to the panel. Uh, so appreciate your participation in that. Um, other panelists um, who want to uh, weigh in on this question of some of the, the other key trends um, that uh, re really are, are going to be drivers over the next decade or so. Even I could offer one, just one perspective, which is an additional. <clears throat> I think, again, from a global, you can say UN perspective, what is showing up as, as, um, as a new thing is, is this issue of interconnectedness. And there, the concept of network multilateralism has been introduced. And it's to recognize that while by definition, multilateralism means collaboration by nations, that is insufficient. <laughs> and therefore, network multilateralism is about opening up and recognizing that academia works internationally in multilateral ways. Private sector does that too, civil society. But you also have a lot of other network type organization. And it's a matter of, can we bring them together around common goals? Can we bring them together on platforms where there can be, you can say, uh, conversations that is not blocked by some of the global competition we're talking about. So, so, so it's just to say that it's a kind of, can you put, push forward a meaningful network multilateralism? If we can, that can accelerate an interconnectedness. And inversely, if that gets blocked by, you can say, uh, uh, competition among and even a division in the world, then obviously this kind of conversations will be blocked, making it more difficult to achieve some of the goals we need to achieve in, in handling, for example, crisis, the pandemic, et cetera. So let me just stop there offering that concept. Well, that, that tracks science, I think, quite closely to what Angela said in, in her opening about the importance of interconnectedness. And, and it, it raises this in, interesting question of, uh, is, is interconnectedness an asset or liability as we all move forward? And, and um, you know, maybe it's moving uh, in parallel with the, the technology question that's also been raised as, as the double-edged sword. These things are, are complex systems with, with positives and, and with, with challenges. And it seems the interconnectedness piece is, is maybe in that same category. Yeah, I could build on that if that's possible, Stephen. Yeah, um, please. I think, you know, we're not, Let's be, we have to get real about how we're organized as well, right? We, we tend to like to focus on the trends in the world out there and very little about how we organize to deal with reality. And I'll, I'll base this comment on my reflections of working in the OECD with lots of different governments around the machinery of policy making. And there's a big challenge in that we deal all the time with a myth 
of the policy machine rather than the reality of it. We have this nice, neat model that science speaks truth to power, policy makes some rational plan, then somebody else goes and implements it. And then, hey ho, at the end, we've got an outcome and we can measure and audit it. And the problem with that process, which is called the linear waterfall process, is that the thinking gets done five years before the action gets implemented. And then somehow at the end, somebody works out, were we successful or not? And the reality has changed completely in that period. So one of the challenges in the way we have to think about trends is also to think about the trends in mindsets and cognition and policy, it's policy making itself. What is the policy machinery? How is it becoming more, we, could, we talk about agile policy, but actually our policy machinery is wired for stability. We talk about transformational action, but our policy machine is wired for incrementalism. So I think it's also important when, we, when we're thinking about how do we open up to either creating or preparing for new and better future possibilities that we also get real with the institutional basis of the policy machinery and not to blame or expect too much from the so-called futurist or the foresighter, but actually to ask policy makers. Policy design is a new concept. It's very different from policy making in the old style. So I think the process of policy is changing and it's changing in response to the realities and the stresses of trying to solve new challenges which are more connected and concern judgments of quality, not just quantity. And that becomes very important as we think about the role of organizations like yourself. Thank you. Um, and, you know, if I could just, your comments have prompted a follow-up, Angela, which um, as you talk about this, this shift to policy design, is that something that you are seeing happening um, in, uh, through an organic process that's just naturally um, evolving? Or is it out of necessity from external shocks? Or are, are we seeing uh, an inflection point that's, that's requiring that in a more dramatic fashion? I'm sure that everybody else can chip in here, but I, I think there's two things. First of all is the pattern in the world is still the replication of hierarchy for most organizational forms, right? Top down command and control, uh, linear leadership. That's still the majority models everywhere, but the world is, doesn't conform to that model anymore. It's sort of 19th century organizational forms. Um, but when we, when we see this shift to policy design, I think there's two things going on. One is ad hoc. But the other is, I think, much more organized. If I look around different governments, if I look to Singapore, to Finland, to the UK, if I look into the US, we see nudge units, we see new policy design forms. We need, we, they're, they're called different things, but they're trying to grapple with the issue that the, the machinery of decision-making by government, the processes of decision-making by government, if they're really to absorb the open future possibility, they have to change the process by which policy is being made. Thank you. Um, any other final thoughts on this topic from the panel before we, we move on? Okay, so, um, you, you know, COVID has come up a, a few times today already, the pandemic, um, obviously it's it's been with us now, um, you know, nearly two years and, um, you know, organizations, institutions, governments across the world have been working to respond to this crisis um, in real time, as the Comptroller General in his opening remarks talked about um, trying to operate in a real time environment here. Uh, now, the current crisis, right, has, it's become a bit of a cliche to say we are in unprecedented times, and it seems every few years we're saying we're in unprecedented times. So I don't want to um, fall into that trap, but if we're to look at what we've been through um, uh, in, in the last uh, couple of years with this and think about the lessons, but also some of the innovations, the ideas, if we're gonna put a bit more of a, a positive spin on this, 
Um, what are some of the ideas and innovations that have come out of the crisis that um, are, are important lessons to keep in mind that you think we ought to be carrying forward um, as we kind of build that aspirational future we've all been talking about? Uh, yeah, so what if we could start with you on, on that question? I, I, I would like to mention three maybe that comes to mind. First and foremost, apart from the, you can say emergency medical response, one thing that just had, has been accelerated significantly and has shown as being, you know, an absolutely um, um, effective way of dealing with the situation has been accelerated, accelerated digitization. So that means across all economies globally, it has been absolutely no regret investments. And therefore, what Angela has mentioned is that now the question is that the downside of digitization doesn't get ahead of us. You know, that, that, that's such an upside. <laughs> but a lot of people in the world are very, very vulnerable. Uh, uh, and therefore, global regulation for cybercrime, uh, cybersecurity, is probably an area where there would be increased multilateral review. It has been kept out. It has been very much US, US, Europe driven. But I think everybody realizes now that it requires more broad global regulation so we can bring everybody in. So, and, and I think as we continue to sit in, 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 in the corona epidemic or pandemic, we, 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 that, you know, globalization, global digitization, not only bringing people on the internet, but also truly digitize education, health, et cetera. That, that I think will, will, will holds enormous potential if the other thing doesn't get ahead of us, as, as it were. Then there are two other things. I think that it has done something to the way many people in the world think. Those who are closer to getting high quality information on the pandemic, they realize that every person is part of a global chain. Uh, and therefore, if, if, if the epidemic stops with you because you take a vaccination or you behave a certain way or you pass it on, it is truly a global chain you're part of. So I think some people in the world have gotten a better perspective of their role and how they connect with others. And I think that that will, in some areas, give a possibility for a more global conversation and a more, we are back to that feeling of connectedness. And then finally, uh, contrary to how it looked in the beginning, I think that there's a global realization that no country can stop this pandemic. So therefore there is only a global solution. And it is the speed of that solution that will determine whether we need a next one in the Greek alphabet uh, uh, or we, or you know, we 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 stop it this winter, and then I don't think we will eradicate it, but we'll get to live with it the way that other uh, issues like HIV/AIDS and others, you know, that that we understand it, it is there, etc. And and that sense that only global action get us there, and then finally global action was possible. And while there's enormous discussion of vaccine disparity where clearly Africa is right now underserved. Nevertheless, it, it, it is global and it's surprisingly global. So that combination between we can find the remedy, we can find it in multiple countries. And now we can learn that if, if we're a bit smarter about how we get certain things organized, then we can globally address global things. And, and you know, a year from now, two years from now, we may look back at some of those experiences and then say, hmm, can we do better then? And then apply them to other global crises like the climate or biodiversity. So in what I'm saying is that in the middle of this problem, there's a sense of optimism because the realization is this is truly global and you cannot outperform global from a national perspective in these areas. And competition has no place. We can compete as much as we want, but the more we compete, the longer this thing will, will stay around for all of us. So it's, it's, it forces collaboration maybe where collaboration otherwise is difficult. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the perspectives. Thank you, Jens. Uh, 
uh, any other thoughts on this question from uh, the panelists? Yeah, uh, Angela. Hey, well, what we what we've observed is that it's it's triggered a rethinking of resilience, and particularly of critical systems resilience. So that now extends to people and supply chain, not just to the kit and the technical cadre, but to people and supply chain. So that's that's another positive um, thinking. I, I I do want to say though, it's also prompted a rethinking about meaning and purpose, particularly for the under 40s generation. We are witnessing the grand resignation. I don't know if that's a term that applies in, in the US, but people are not sticking with jobs that they don't like, that they don't want to put up with this anymore. Life is to be lived and it's to be lived, lived purposefully. So that's another, whether you take that as a positive or a negative, it's certainly, it's tough because it contributes to the war for talent because some of these people are taking big skills out of the market. But it also is, I think, a, you know, a reassertion of everything isn't about material and data and numbers. It's actually about relationships and meaning and life's purpose. That's, I think, come to the fore. And I think the other piece that we all have to be aware of is the COVID context response has created a new context of affordability and demand for justice. It's the, re the revelation of the great unevenness on many things. I mean, Jens was talking about the positive side of that, but I think the jury is still out as to whether the trigger long-term, you know, we're two years into something that's at least five years long. There's a great impatience to get it over with. And I'm worried that the impatience turns into a negative relocalization of resilience. Security becomes withdrawing rather than persisting in trying to make the benefits of doing things together work for the, because we can get better scale in doing things together. But I am worried about patience and impatience when people want it to be over and the messages are, we're over it. Oh, no, we're not. Oh, we're over it. Mm, no, we're not. Ooh, we're over it. No, we're not. So there's this, this tension between it's going to be around for five years, but everybody wants to be able to say they, they can see the end of it now. Yeah. yeah maybe Stephen, um, I, I think there's two points. It's been a bit discussed, but it is kind of, I think two big things actually is, is like one is that certain things as Angela noticed is, certain elements were seen as costs right to the public like the the healthcare system and certain people are invaluable etc and you know but i think that this has shown that um there, there's the, the view of, of some of these very basic elements that create that resilience um that if you get it right you have more resilience into, into society they've become more seen as investments but but what I'm wondering about is exactly that, like, it, it's going to depend on how much time this is going to last, the crisis, for actually budgets to shift, to, for actually, because if you have to hold your breath for two years, uh, you might change your mindset, but it doesn't structurally change anything in budgets or in, in kind of where talent is developed and where investments are made. Well, if you have a long-term perspective on this, or you think this is going to happen again and again, and we go into a life of crisis, and, and we will have more of these things, or bio-warfare, bio or whatever it is, where it comes from, or from the climate change, if you then you start to actually have another mindset and actually shift budget. So I haven't seen too much shifts yet that, that I think that are, that the jury is still out on whether we're in, an, in this mindset or, or in a bigger one. On the collaboration, Yes, people have started to understand they are part of a large, bigger system, but I also have my doubts sometimes about kind of whether that has created more um, openness to other people or the fact that um, the, the self-sufficiency, the self-security might have taken over more. And, and also juries out on that, people has left, has left uh, traveled less also. People have less connected. And as we all know, it's one of the real good ways of creating a, so, a global sense or a community sense is to get to know each other and to know each other. And it's been so much easier um, to not have that in the virtual world. We all live in that virtual world that we don't like our kids to live in because 
you know, there's a lot more negative things going on in social life that are happening. We're all living in that kind of a, a more in the world. So there is less like socially, social connection, let's say, that is that 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 creates some of that compassion and that connection. Um, and so it's at the human level again and how we relate to each other, but also at national levels. Uh, we are realizing we're all work part of that bigger world and our actions matter. I'm not sure we're all taking the same conclusions on whether we need to connect more or that we have to retrieve more. Yeah. I'll, I'll take Jason, one stab please. at this and, and, and I agree with many of the other things that the panelists have said. I'll just add one additional thought and that is it's about the relationship between governments and the private sector. You know, there are a couple of areas where I see that it's really fascinating to see how things have changed. So let's just take, you know, pharmaceuticals. You know, the narrative before the pandemic and, you know, a lot of the public was they didn't like pharmaceutical companies because they thought they charged too much for drugs and they weren't very happy about that. And there are lots of things that, you know, individual companies can do and there are lots of things that the federal government can do, but it was only when the federal government and the private sector came together and we had this, you know, explosion of creativity and tremendous power put behind and you know we now have vaccines to combat the virus you know it'll be interesting to see if that narrative continues in the in the in the trajectory that it has or if things revert i think the second area where it comes up again the government can do certain things and the private sector can do certain things but you've got to have concerted effort between the two is on the topic of disinformation so the, the reality is in the United States and across the globe, there are some number of people who just aren't going to believe, you know, narrative that is gonna come out of the government about a vaccine or wearing masks or things like that. That's the reality we are in now. And so the government can't address that issue in and of itself. And, the, and then you've got the private sector and the, the discussion and the debate about the contributions of social media companies to spreading dis disinformation and the extent to which they've they've um, successfully addressed that. It really does take effort on both parts. And so it'll be interesting to see if that shapes some of the future debates about the intersection between the private sector and, and governments across the globe. Yes, a Angela, please. So foresight abhors convergence and agreeing with each other on things. So I want to push, I want to kick the tires on this one. Um, states and markets. I think we have seen a great response from big states and from big business, but I think small and medium sized enterprise might not think it's so hunky dory what's been happening around this whole coalition of um, uh, public private sector. And I think you know, ever since public private partnerships came out after the first Earth Summit in 19 of Joe Berg's first summit as the answer of how we have to bring states and markets together. And I think for the last 20 years, we've been living with this myth of public private means government and business. There's always a third um, leg on the sustainable development stool and it's communities and community cooperatives are on the rise. Community ownership is on the rise. And communities come in all shapes and sizes. That's why we don't like to deal with them. They're so messy. We've got coalitions of industry. We've got rural communities. We've got cities as communities. And again, I was very interested to read the US scenarios from the National Tenants Council, because when you look at what you're measuring for your scenarios, cities and digitization preparedness. So cities are an actor now, not just governments and businesses. So where does that fit in to the way we think about what's happening as we emerge from this crisis? Yeah, it, it's, it's a great segue, I think, in, into the next um, topic I wanted to get us into a bit in terms of uh, inclusive um, futures, uh, ways Foresight can try to bring uh, that perspective to the table. Um, as, as you just described, Angela, having communities um, uh, represented. And, and certainly we've been seeing the trends, um, not only in the US, but across the globe in terms of uh, inequities and in, in various outcomes, whether it's um, widening disparities in uh, household wealth creation, in um, home ownership, um, access to healthcare or various financial services, just to name a few. So 
where where can foresight help in the in the policy space with some of these questions? Um, and 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 how does that um, you know create you know potentially better futures as we as we look at some of those um, uh, communities? Uh, Jens, maybe um, start, we'll start with you on that question. Yeah. Let me be very brief. I think that we are also as part of the learning on the COVID, we come to the realization that inequality or exclusion, apart from it being a problem in itself, it actually is increasingly visible as a political parameter. So therefore in societies where you have high level of exclusion and high level of distrust, you do not have policy agility. And it is not because those countries do not know what to do, but it is because if, if sways of society or parts of society feel that they are not part of benefiting generally from top-down policies, then they will not accept another top-down policy, whatever, however sensible it may be. And secondly, if they feel that nobody cares about them, so that means they cannot appear as a community in some kind of a bottom-up to use Angeles, way of thinking about it. If they cannot come in bottom up and respond to a situation and, and the, that the environment is created for them so they can respond to the situation, they end up blocking it. And obviously in Europe, the yellow vest is, is the strongest example, but more from where I sit, there are just examples in practically every country today that has policy issues that they, that are, they are obvious that change is required but they cannot execute change because part of their population is, feels excluded. So inversely, if foresight can bring that as a, as, a, as a kind of capability parameter and then add value apart from the intrinsic value of inclusiveness, also explain it makes for more agile societies, it makes for societies that can have a deeper dialogue about the futures they want and that it, it makes for society that can kind of co-create certain things and that means adapt to the realities throughout the specific territory, then, then I think foresight could help tremendously. So, so it's understood that, that way. Let me leave it at that. Thanks, Jens. A any other thoughts on, on that uh, question? No, Christophe, I, I yeah. think... Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's one of the things I said in the opening also, I mean, I think like these participatory futures, inclusive futures, whatever you want to call it, kind of bringing people together to actually really think through what the future might be is, is really important in, in the sense of um, most people um, and, and the short term thinking that was mentioned before, um, like of policymakers, they're not like long in, in their jobs, etc. I think that's kind of a, a false way of thinking about it. Um, I, most people do not think about what the future could be or what the future will be. So it's really hard for people actually to, to have opinions about these things, right? So, and so some experts kind of make those conclusions for society. If society obviously is not kind of taken on the journey of being, uh, of thinking through what might be the positives or negatives about a certain technology or something or a way forward, then you can't really blame them on the other side to, Kind of, you know, people don't like change if they don't see why it's needed or they don't come together necessarily if they don't understand what the what kind of the, the, the you know the trade-offs are. So I think foresight, like really helping people come together and think through that future, what are some of the things that might happen? What are some of the things we would? It, it's it's been proven in certain cases that is really. Um, good the problem is that it's really hard to do uh, i think it's really hard to do because you expose yourself um right i mean it's kind of a lot of policymakers who think it's their job to know it's a level of expertise right and then what what angela was saying like it, it's messy to work with all of these people right it, it it's long it's messy who do you bring into the thing how do you react and how do you bring you know people together that are have very different views and worldviews etc it, it doesn't necessarily make it faster, <laughs> right? But it might make it better. And, and it is that trade-off actually. And it's just a very different way of working and operating in society that we, that, that's just not been traditionally done. Um, so I think if, if foresight can bring that, it would be a 
big advantage, actually. Um, even if it's hard to do, we should at least try. Thank you, Christo. Um, I'm keeping an eye on our, our clock. Uh, this has been such a fantastic conversation. Um, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Um, we do have a lot of people from GAO um, tuning in today and who will see this session in the future. And I wanted to give you each the uh, opportunity briefly to just say if there was one thing you wanted to um, tell our people as we start creating the next hundred years for our organization, um, what's one message you would like to emphasize uh, from where you sit for our people to, um, to think about? Um, I'm going to start uh, with uh, Angela on that and then circle around uh, my screen to uh, Christelle, then Jason, then, then Jens. Um, Angela, please. Wow, one thing. I, sh I shall pick up on the last one around participation simply because that's where my head is. If I was to give you one phrase to think about, having listened to the initial opening and the first panel, it's, it's that the future is about experts on tap, not on top. And that everybody now is an expert of some kind. And then when, when we have, when we want to do these, um, when we want to do these multidisciplinary things, we have to think: what does multidisciplinary really mean? And it means as much about craft as it and doing as it does about thinking. And I think that's multidisciplinary to me in foresight is not being a future thinker; it's being a future maker. And those practice that that disciplinary difference is remarkable so experts on tap not on top and and having the capabilities for future making not just thinking thank you angela um christelle yeah i would say it's um what's your mindset i would say because uh good state good decisions bad state bad decisions as they say and so if you have a negative mindset, I'm very good at that. A negative mindset about what might happen uh, and be in the fear of kind of the future, then you, you're gonna try to solve the problems and more hanker, kind of keep keep that stuff out, right? And, and stick with, with the best. While if you are in a good mindset and you, you think about possibilities and about opportunities, then you're gonna become a lot more resourceful to actually shape the future. So really, that mindset is um, not very great in surveys from uh, that, that we're seeing coming up. But so watch your mindset, be in a positive, resourceful, opportunity kind of state and watch that. Thank you. Jason. Yeah, I, I would say I, I've got the benefit of being the insider on this question. And so I, I think it really does come back to our mission. You know, we're really aimed at trying to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of federal programs and activities for the benefit of Congress and the American people. Much of our work is focused on auditing programs that have already been implemented and making recommendations for how they could be improved moving forward. But I think the other piece to this is we can improve the future effectiveness and efficiency of federal programs and activities when we do some of these prospective analyses, lay out those options for the policymakers. We're not the policymakers, but when we can give them really good, high quality, reliable information upon which they can make those decisions and understand those trade-offs, I think that's where we should be headed. And last word, Jens. I think when one consider both policy and progress, one, one wants to accept the multidimensionality of of what is good for human beings, you know, the complexity of it. And a good way to, to, to think about that is to understand the word sustainability, the way, you know, there are 17 goals behind it. And then, as I mentioned, accept the centrality of our current growth paradigm driven by, by GDP, and then adjust the GDP to better capture that future that we have to navigate in. So we still use a, a reliable tool, but we just use it more, more efficiently. So the word is, accept and embrace multidimensionality and then give it direction. Thank you, Jens. Um, I wanted to thank this panel very much. Um, Jason, thank you for providing um, the inside perspective uh, uh, from GAO. And, and also very much uh, thanks to uh, Angela, Christelle, and uh, Jens, uh, valuable members of our Center for Strategic Foresight and um, great thinkers on, on these issues. So thank you for your time today. Uh, Tim and I want to uh, close out with a few um, uh, final statements. Uh, Tim, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Steve. And uh, just uh, adding to Steve's thanks, 
Thanks so much to our panelists today and for all of your, uh, all of the folks uh, tuning into this. This has been an extremely important discussion. Just a note of, uh, as a reminder, for those of you claiming a CPE in today's event, uh, the link to the CPE certificate is uh, going to be put in the chat box. Uh, so for our GAO colleagues joining us today, a link to the certificate will also be placed on the GAO Centennial webpage. Let me just summarize some of the top level key messages from both panels today. The first is that we live in a world of complex adaptive systems challenges that are increasing in frequency, impact and number. I think climate change, think emerging infectious diseases, digital security and equities, et cetera. So that's our, our baseline state. So therefore too, the future of oversight and policymaking is digital, it's content centric, it's interdisciplinary and it's agile. And, and so we have to think of differently about how we do our jobs, both in the oversight community and as we support our policymakers. And then third, we would do well to view our challenges through the optic of foresight uh, how might we, as Steve asked, that's the, that's the design question that drives STAA, how might we uh, design the future we want and shape it based upon a more communicative, collaborative, cross-sectoral and problem-centered approach? So those are the, the three key things, I think, to summarize where we are. There's a very exciting future before us. Uh, for the last century, GAO has played uh, a vital role in its support of Congress. But I know GAO's value to the American people will only continue to grow uh, in the next century. And I don't think it's a linear growth. I think it's an exponential growth in terms of impact and, and importance. So thank you all for joining us today. And we'll now, uh, I'll toss it back to Steve for his closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, first, just wanted to thank everyone who made today possible um, uh, on the GAO, uh, GAO side and also um, our external partners. And you know, pick up on a phrase we heard from Angela, future maker, uh, as we all turn from the centennial uh, year uh, to look ahead at the next 100 years for GAO and for our place in, in government and in our democracy, we all play a role in creating that future. And the next evolution of GAO as an institution and as an organization working inside that democracy, we are all helping create that future. Um, so I heard lots of words today about agility, uh, dialogue, and finally future maker. I think those are all fantastic concepts for us to take forward into the next hundred years of GAO. We thank you sincerely for helping us celebrate this year and today. Uh, be well, take care, and uh, have a good rest of the year. Thank you. <laughs>